didn't hit it. <clears throat> Good job. Right, You're learning. Look at that. We, got, we, got we are blanks. recording. I got blinky blanks. And I did not break my cranium. Pop, pop. Good job. Pop it, pop it, pop it, baby, the zebra, boobula, hummel, baby, the zebra, bop. I love how my mic's picking you up because you're loud. Well, that's... We're actually pretty balanced in this thing. That's right. It's a perfect balance. All right. You ready to do this? I will be Number ready. 43? I will be ready in... What? That's oh, the episode. Three. Yes. Yeah. I thought you said, oh, will you be ready in 43? I'm like, that's an oddly specific amount of time. 43 but yes. nanoseconds. Done. <laughs> okay. Done. <laughs> Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to episode number 043 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I'm Drew Brown. Yeah, you are. And we are here from Goulet Pens, literally, again, to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. Today's Earth Day, everybody. Uh, was it April 22nd as we're publishing this? Uh, so we're going to have an, I don't know, I'll call it an Earth Day show. Not everything Earth Day, but we'll talk about it. We're going to change the little peacock logo Earth. to green at the bottom. Yeah, there you go. That makes a difference. Um, and uh, we're going to show you some of our packing process. That's kind of cool. Take you around the warehouse. Uh, we've got uh, some talk about pens with swappable parts, uh, discounting pens. And if everybody's doing it, is it really discounting? Ooh. Yeah, got some probing questions there. Uh, Japanese ink and vintage pens, and is it harmful? Uh, how the pandemic has impacted the pen industry so far. Thought that was kind of a compelling question. Uh, and we're also gonna be spotlighting the Lamy CP1, and we got a tip about labeling some ink sample vials. So it should be a good one. But let's start it off with some feedback. All right, so the most I guess often submitted piece of feedback mm. we got from last week involved myself and uh, some 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 kind admonishment uh, regarding my complete ignorance of the uh, I guess the gravity of the number forty two in the, Is the, in the in answer the, to the universe or apparently whatever? yes yeah, it's, the... it's, a, it's a thing from <laughs> uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that's what it is a book that I have never read a movie that I've never See, seen that, why am I off the hook on this like, I think so no one said anything about you it was only about me am I not expected to know what it I is? think that because I am more of the nerd persuasion I have a different standard pushed upon me by the, that's the fair. So, so you you should have known I kind of a so. thing and but it's okay that i didn't i suppose so so uh i will i will throw one back and say i am the type of nerd that says the number 19 is everything and any fans of the dark tower will understand what i'm talking about I don't but know no i've never um is. i've never seen that book I've never seen that book or read that movie mm. um but i will because i have been told to so <laughs> Thank Apparently you. you need to. Yes. So I I knew about the 42 thing. I didn't remember what it was referenced to. And actually before we were shooting, I think as we were like getting set up, I was like, oh, it's episode 42. That's like a, a thing. I knew it was a thing. And it was like the whatever the universe. I can't even remember what it is. Again, low expectations on my part for nerdery things, right? But uh, I mentioned it to you. And I guess because I didn't give it enough of a reference of what it was actually about, it didn't actually prompt you. You were like, oh, okay. You know, and it didn't oh, like, I wouldn't it didn't have known anyway. In. Okay. I would have no idea. I don't know a thing about that mo that book series. No clue. I know Martin right. Freeman is in the movie. That, that's all I know. Well, you heard it here, everybody. Drew's going to become an expert on the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. No, it's become no. his new it was also, passion. Uh, coincidentally, last week was actually um, Jackie Robinson's birthday, and he was uh, number 42 was on his jersey. So oh, it was a 42 week. So we week. should have mentioned that. We were ignorant of that yeah. as well. So. There you go. Yeah, we don't know sports or apparently all nerd things. There are there are many things we're is, ignorant of. Is there of, an expectation that's... that you should know like all all franchises of nerd thing? Because I feel like it's there's a lot there. Like I, there's I a feel, lot of ways you could go with that. Yeah, I feel like um there's should I I feel like there should have been some cursory mm. knowledge, like just okay. some tangential. Just, some, just, an, just a little nod to it. I, I just feel like it should have happened upon me sooner. Okay. You know, kind of like how I haven't seen um, hmm. The original Point Break. Like, why, why, why now do I need to go at 38 years old and find Point Break? Why didn't Point mm. Break just happen to me earlier? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that that should have just happened. What is sooner. Point Break? Remind me. Point Break is the movie with Keanu and. Um, okay, that's uh, what I thought. It's like a surfing movie, right? Yeah, a heist. Oh. A heist slash surfing. A heist slash. How do you 
surf heist. Well, I, we need seems to like see a, the movie. Seems like a very ineffective way to get away from we a heist. We need to see the movie. No, there's not. I'm going to swim out, but then I'll come back. I don't think they do that. They wear the masks and stuff. I, li- I have no context. Yeah, neither do I. I, I associated mean, I with Keanu bit. Reeves. Was that like his breakout movie or something? I don't his know. point breakout? Oh, ah, anyway, okay. let's move on. Um, <laughs> so uh, Kimberly <laughs> sent me a picture of a squirrel because in this pen cast we have talked previously about squirrels with random food objects mm-hmm, it started mm-hmm. with a story of a squirrel eating a donut and then many people added theirs kimberly mm-hmm. was still at it either going through historical episodes or this thing just happened she sent me a picture of a squirrel eating an entire mince pie like a mince meat pie like a pie in its mouth just like chilling with a pie up in the tree like there's no limit to what these animals will get a hold of they're and pretty they're enjoy. pretty uh they're pretty wily they will they will get their hands wily is a good word why yeah. is a good word yeah. um and then this one i won't read this verbatim because it is a lengthy email but uh, i did want to touch on some uh, high points this is an email from mm-hmm. jacob um jacob said that uh in just about three to four weeks ago he got really into pens after finding the channel and um he had previously only had an amazon uh, a metropolitan he got on amazon but uh went okay. like on a crazy spending spree he got like 17 pens i had to cut himself off so i get that <laughs> we've all been there. i don't know what that's like at all yeah um but sadly he said that recently his grandfather had passed away mm-hmm. um and uh, this is while mm-hmm. he's uh he, he's a younger person going through college um, right in the midst of his finals he decided to uh, write his grandfather's eulogy with a fountain pen that he had bought from our store, uh, specifically a Diplomat Arrow. Hmm. Um, And uh, the thing that really got me was that he used this pen, you know, in his words, you know, to convey it in a form greater than a lifeless word doc. Mm. Um, So this is where I'll begin reading verbatim. The way I see it, I managed to put a little bit of my soul into that pen onto those pages, Mm. a little bit of soul into that pen onto those pages that will live forever. I created a memento to the love he and I shared. I'm just a dumb kid, so I don't know that much. We'll get to that later. Um, but I do know for certain that even though I'm only 20, you've helped make a fountain pen user for life. So truly, deeply, thanks for all of this. Even in such a short time, I already think that this content community and service has made a fundamental impact on me that I won't ever forget. Wow. That's huge. Um, and I will start off by saying, uh, you're not a dumb kid, Jacob. And a lot of us are dumb kids. And I guarantee you I was because at 20, I didn't know that I was a dumb kid. And that... Mm. That right there proves that you are not a dumb kid because when you are a dumb kid, you don't know you're a dumb kid. Mm. So already you've got a leg up on most dumb 20-year-olds. So <laughs> congratulations on that. But seriously, I think that one of the biggest um, indicators of intelligence is when you know how unintelligent you are. Mm. Stupid people don't know they're stupid. Generally speaking. There you go. Yeah. So good job, Jacob. I think there's a difference between dumb and just ignorant. Like right, you, just, right. you haven't lived... Exactly. As much life yet. But I think that the more, the more, you know, the more aware you are of your own ignorance Mm. is a sign of intelligence as far as what I've seen and the people that I've known that I've respected and been inspired by. So Mm. I think this is a really, really beautiful, beautifully worded email. And I appreciate you sharing that with us, Jacob. That's really um, cool. And just how meaningful it ought to be and, and have something physically written down. I mean, Google Docs, look, they're great, you know, and digital things like that. Sure, they're fantastic for a lot of different things. You know, but some of that's like the modern equivalent of, you know, writing it on a napkin and kind of throwing it away afterwards. You yeah. know, I mean, it's Rachel and I have like our emails saved away somewhere from when we first met. But like the physical things that we have are, you know, more tangible and easier for us to find. And we have to store them and they're kind of a pain and we have to take care of them. But, you know, somebody said for that, it does feel a little more meaningful. Exactly. And that's the <laughs> one of the most beautiful things about fountain pen because Jacob had his pen in the color that he picked out and the yeah. nib size that he picked out in the ink that he picked out that's cool. writing something that only he could write. If it was a Word document, mm. yes, it would be words that he created, but there would mm. be nothing unique to him about those words. And now mm. it is 100% uniquely his. And I think that we've all experienced something like that where we've written something and mm. known that no one else writes in this style of handwriting with this color, with mm. this nib, with this pen. It is 100% your own. And I just think that's one of the greatest things about our uh, our pens. And I'll say one more thing before we move on. Uh, he mentioned specifically, um, in, I already think that this content community and service has made a fundamental impact on mm. me that I won't ever forget the community aspect. I just have to shout that out specifically yeah. because this fountain pen community is unlike any other community I've ever even been tangentially a part of. It really yeah. is something amazing, astounding, tremendously supportive. 
And, you know, the, a comment like this on YouTube will get so much love from other people, just, you know, people he's never met, yeah. but people that are going to connect with that and, you know, express their condolences and respect and inspiration. And I think that's just a beautiful thing. So well, we're, we're all a part of that too, right? Like, even though the, the community, you know, it's a group of people that evolves and changes and some people come, some people leave, you know, everybody elects to be a part of this pen community. But I mean, no joke, even when it's not like I grew up with a love of fountain pens, I was ignorant to it. Even at your age at 20, I didn't never use a fountain pen in my life. First one to use, I was 25. Uh, it was the community and the sense of passion and just the enthusiasm that this, you know, eclectic group of people all came together to share the interest in these pens. I saw that and I was like, there's something here. Yes. There's something special about this. I got to learn more about this. And that is what drew me in. So I would not be here. Probably none of us would be here if it were not for that passion of the community because we would have never recognized that as something appealing and being a part of it. So it's just cool how after, what, 13 years now since that happened that it's still going and new people are coming in, but that same just like undercurrent of passion and enthusiasm still carries through even with you know a whole new generation it's, it's really really even cool. if i hated fountain pens if i were injected into the community like if i came with somebody to a pen show i'd mm. probably just lie my way into the hobby be like i don't like these things at all but i'd fake it just so i could be a part of it be a part of it just like because yeah. it, it really is there is an x factor there it's is something cool. magical about it and what's crazy is so jacob at the time that we discovered fountain pens, Jacob is younger than our ki what our kids are now. So he was younger than our kids' age when we first discovered and got into fountain pens. Oh, okay, pens. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So like, there are our, like kids, our kids' age and younger, who could be Jacob in like 10, 13 years. Isn't that crazy? That is really crazy. Anyway, and just carries on. So very, very cool. It's so rewarding. Um, got some other feedback. So um, had some very helpful comments for people about Pelican. Again, we we went in, you know, ankle deep into the pool of Pelican naming conventions, but we knew we weren't covering everything. We weren't trying to, but we had some very helpful comments and we thought it was worth just a mention to anybody interested. You know, again, we're focused on fountain pens, really. And the M series demarcation is their piston filler uh, you know, fountain pen series. And so that's everything that we're familiar with, really. Um, uh, so apparently the P designation is for their cartridge filling pens, which is interesting because we haven't had, the only cartridge Pelican pens that we've really carried have been the lower priced ones. And they are like called the Pelicano, the Pelicano Junior, the Twist. Right. They haven't really had that P designation. So right. it wasn't anything that we were really hyper aware of. But I guess maybe some of the higher end pens, they do that. So it's interesting. Um, K is for the ballpoint. R is for the roller ball. And D is for the mechanical pencil. So it's kind of interesting. And I am I know the German words that these things mean is where those letters come from. And I'm not going to attempt to say them. But feel free to knock yourself out if you want to, Drew. But um, they're long and complicated. So we'll save you the trouble. But um, there you go. And apparently if it has an N at the end of the number, that means that it's basically like a remake of an, of an existing older model, which makes sense because we had like the what M, M101N, I think it was. It sounds familiar. That was like a, a bringing it back. So that that actually makes a lot of sense. But see, that stuff like right really wasn't explained to us even when that pen came out. No. The designations weren't explained. It's just no. like, there's like, I don't know, I guess Pelican's we been could, We could do a, very quick, long time. a quick Google. Like, you know, there are resources out there. We just didn't do it. And there there was at least one comment that sure. said that they were disappointed in our lack of knowledge, Brian. So there, Well, I, that's the thing is we knew no matter how much we tried to prepare and research for that, we were going to disappoint people because there is so much you can go into that that you yeah. know, people will want to go further. And I will say that, you know, we could if we wanted to do a ton of research before these shows and try to dot all of our I's and cross all of our T's. Well, we do try to do some, but it's like, we got to cut it off. We're not going to go, we're not going to go deep on all of it. You know, we're, yeah. we're, we're sharing what we have and we're learning along with you. There are a lot of things that I add onto this mm -hmm. so that we can have this dialogue back and forth. Because like I said earlier, this is a community. This is yeah. a live thing. When we're <laughs> sitting here, we know you're sitting right there with us That's right. right now. <laughs> so as far as I'm concerned, we're answering all this stuff together. This is something we are sharing with you. Yeah. This is not a lecture. This is a this is a correspondence. And we disclaim that this is superfluous as well. Also so that. We give a caveat at the beginning yes. of every show. We're only going to go so deep. Um, shout out, though, the Pelican's Perch. Great blog post if you want to go really deep on all things Pelican. 
that's more thorough than we'll ever be on the subject. So yeah, we'll, we'll link this out. in the uh, description. So yeah, absolutely. Check that out so if you yeah, Pelicans Perch, they have a lot of great info, but they also have a really good um, uh, designation for fountain pen nib sizes and stuff like that. They also have a ton <clears> of <throat> nibs available like all through the, like there, there's probably like 50 different nibs. oh yeah it's insane you can get nib customization done if you go to the factory like you can actually go and order a pen and then get it customized there i think you have to like schedule it or something this is all pre-pandemic i don't know how they're doing it now but at least before all that stuff happened you could actually go get a tour order a pen have them customize it at the factory that sounds pretty That's cool crazy. but anyway um john also had some feedback why don't you use the ooze tube up here uh, as a timer for Brian's explanations, since it's right there, might as well use it. Well, this ooze tube, the big one, uh, it takes 15 minutes oh, to go no. all the way down. Don't so use that. Sounds pretty good to me. No. I've done some deep dive questions no. that have Where's approached that. Where's the little one? Don't you have a smaller the one? The little one is in my office, and that goes four minutes. There so you that's go. probably that's a better probably one to use. And that's the OG. <laughs> that's the OG one. Yeah, but that's a, that's a good idea, John. Maybe we'll uh, look into that. Um, and then we got a handful of some amazing humans who correctly identified uh, Captain Bucky O'Hare. Oh, yeah, he's right up here. Up here? Yeah, he's barely in frame. But uh, yeah, so Bucky O'Hare. So Drew and I in our elementary school days would play Bucky O'Hare uh, characters on the playground together. And Drew is the only person I ever knew who <laughs> knew who Bucky O'Hare was. I thought for a long time that I just made him up because I could not find any. This is like before I really actually like researched it on the internet or anything. Maybe like 15, 20 years ago before you could just like Google anything on your phone and find like, out. Is that the all answer. a dream? But yeah, because no one I ever met knew who Bucky O'Hare was. Green Space Rabbit. A Green Space Rabbit. And people are like, what are you talking about? Because I, <laughs> I didn't remember that much. I just remember Bucky O'Hare, Green Rabbit. And that was about it. And they were like, okay, whatever, dude. But then I run into Drew and he knows all kinds of things about, you know, obscure things that don't matter. And he validated that I was not a crazy person we, making this up. There were definitely a good amount of people that was like, is that Bucky? And someone said, I think it is. So. Was that show on for like two years or something? It, it might have like, only, it might have only been one season. There's a lot of kids shows that are like not on that long. But that that specifically is from the uh, Nintendo game, the regular Nintendo game, which is an excellent game. But it came out like mm. right as the Nintendo was dying. Um, so a, it's in, expensive and impossible to buy now. <laughs> and b, uh, not a lot of people knew about it because everybody was playing the Super Nintendo. There you go. But it's still solid. And the show was on for like one year. So go figure. But we know. Thank you all. We feel seen from those of you who. <laughs> Knew, knew what that was. Anyway, that's pretty fun. And uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to some new stuff. All right. So let's talk about some new stuff, shall we? One of the new exciting things, anything Twisby that comes out, generally pretty exciting. Oh, yeah. So uh, I have a few different Twisbys here. I see that. So, you know. I like to flex a little bit. Whenever we get something new, I get to pull out some of my Those nibs are actually from pretty my collection. stiff. <sighs> Well done. You would know. How many uh, avocados would you give this one, Drew? Oh, no avocados. This would be, you know, a uh, half of a zebra and three police cars. <laughs> there you go. Uh, he just comes up with this stuff. Uh, so anyway, we got the Twisby 580 rose gold, white and rose gold 2. So this is the second edition here. Uh, basically, they, they have thicker plating on the rose gold. So um, I guess, you know, when you plate this, rose gold can be finicky sometimes. And it's weird. We had they, all of the first yeah, edition ones, and did, I don't yeah. recall hearing a lot of issues about it, but apparently there were some... Some issues with it flaking off or wearing off or something over time. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, our... our our customers are generally pretty conscientious, so I don't. I, it wasn't like a huge pervasive thing, but there were not a whole lot of pens either. So maybe they heard about it more. I don't know. Uh, so anyway, but basically, they in do, in doing this edition, they wanted to do a, a thicker plating. So um, they've done a couple other pens in this white and rose gold as well. So I have the Eco, uh, which came out. I don't remember when. I didn't look up all the dates. Sorry. Tuesday. And then I have the Mini, which, you know, looks more closely to the 580. Uh, so it's basically just a bigger version. I mean, it's, it's a 580. If you're familiar with it, it's the same pen. It just you get some white uh, parts and then uh, rose gold plated trim. So uh, it's a little more expensive because the rose, rose gold plating, you know, it's a process. And so it's more expensive. You're looking at around $84, uh, which is still not that expensive, but more expensive than your average Twisby, right? 84 84. Ha! That's right. <laughs> Good number. Good number to have. I don't think that was intentionally done for 84 because I don't think Twisby has any of, of specific affiliation with that number. People just gravitate to that number. Price, it, it just It's just like, the, it's, I feel it's like it's the number. nexus of space time. <laughs> Apparently. It's also double 42. So if you add 
42 is together, you get 84. Someone said that in the comments. Two, really? Yep. That's awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, so anyway, I don't really know what else to say about it. I feel like if you know what a 580 is, you're going to know what this pen is. Um, me personally, I think it's I think interesting it looks that really they, good. They, they did the 580 after the, like, kind of le less like the, flagshipy the other pens? pens. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Cause I'm trying to remember the original. Like, what was the first white and rose gold they came out with? I legitimately don't remember. I want to say it was the mini. It might have been. It might have been the mini. I know the, the mini that I have is the, where is it over here? The rose gold uh, two. So I know that was the first rose gold two. Well, they maybe did. that was appropriate then. I don't remember the first I white don't know. rose gold twos. We're did. the wrong people. Sorry. Yeah, we don't actually know stuff. You guys should have known that by this point. I'm just kidding. But uh, anyway, so you can uh, pick that up. We'll have it available. I think it's launching today as of when we're launching this video. Um, and it's a, I don't think it's a special or a limited edition. I think it's just a new regular edition. Yeah, the other ones have been regular. Yeah. So, you know, we'll, they'll keep it going for a while. And uh, that's pretty exciting. So something new from Twisby, always good to see. And then uh, also we have coming out, we were going to like, wait to make a bigger announcement on this new Mayora Alpha. Uh, so they got some really cool colors, but we don't have all of them. We got two of the colors. Um, so the two more, I don't know, I guess, conventional colors, I guess you could say. Yeah, they're like flecked resins as yeah. opposed to the crazy cool stacked stuff. Yeah, so there's like the stacked resins, which do look cool, but we don't have those yet. I don't know when they're coming. So we have the the two colors, the Pompeii and Ercolano, and they do look really cool. Yeah. Nice looking colors. Um, Drew pointed out well that they look like like 90s kind of country theme. No, like Glenn, our photographer design. said, said that, that said yeah, that? he said like late 1800s living room. Like he, he shared oh, some pictures. Okay. Um, I guess a little vintagey in his opinion, but um, mm -hmm. one of them has, yeah, actually, I think it's the Ercolano, not the, the not red one. Which one is that? Oh, I can't anyway, remember. <laughs> one of them has that. You know how those, the cracked, uh, not the cracked ice, kind of the, the turquoise Conklin mm -hmm. has kind of that, that turquoisey highlight around. Yeah, it's got a little hint of that, of that? which which I really dig. It's it's almost like a little. It's a highlight. It's it's just these kind of. I don't know how to describe it, but it's a, it adds a unique depth to it that sometimes flecked resins can look. They're always going to be more full of depth than just kind of your flat colors, but I think with these this little turquoise highlight, it makes it look extra. Deep. Yeah, the Ercolano is the um, yeah that's one the one that you're talking of. about. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm seeing that. I'm I think that's out fun. That little turquoise. Yeah, that is kind of interesting. Yeah, I think that's neat. Neat. Uh, not not the not the colors you see every day. No, certainly not. Very classically kind of theme design pens though. Mm -hmm. Bigger bigger pens. Yeah, not not dissimilar to the Mitho. Yeah, exactly. They look. I'm, honestly, I don't know what the difference is between this and the Mitho. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, we should probably know that. They're very similar. They are, they are. It might not be all that different. It's just a uh, slightly different styling. So anyway, you can check those out. We, I think we'll have them launched. Uh, we should have them launched by the time this video goes out. So you yeah. can check those out. And then out. Uh, no, no date yet on the other colors, but. Uh, Don't know, probably a few weeks out though. Yeah, um, but we'll let you know. Yeah, around $230 for those pens if you're interested. Steel nibs, Yobo nibs. So all around good, for, good performing pens. Those, you know, they're bigger pens. So you gotta like a big, chunky pen but not super heavy so good good daily writers um so yeah another thing or things we will have launched by time this goes live yeah. are going to be the sailor yorameko inks mm. and these inks are unconventional and mm. i say that because i tested them a while ago and they looked pretty boring um mm. they didn't sheen or shade a whole lot because i was using uh, Claire Fontaine Triumph. They looked nice, mm -hmm. just nothing. I had, I had gotten kind of excited because I heard they were really good, yeah. uh, sh uh, kind of a multi-tonal chroma shading. Inks. Yeah. And they didn't really do that. But then mm. I've used them on Tomoe River. Mm. And Rachel had told us that these inks are supposedly going to look different on different types of paper. I'm like, well, that's kind of any ink, right? Yeah, that's what we that's what we got. In like, like every the, ink looks different on different paper. Yeah, it was like the marketing copy that they sent over, which was like sort yeah, of what translated, does that even mean? sort of translated from Japanese. So it was it was it was not the most like right. hyper descriptive. But then I actually yeah. put it on Tomoe River, and it doesn't just look like a different, you know, uh, mm. you know, uh, uh, saturation. 
it was, some of them were kind of different colors yeah. and we're going to be able to communicate all that through our product pages. So, you know, I don't have anything to show you right here in this, you know, in my hands, but we will communicate that because it is a pretty funky situation, but either way, check them out. They're definitely worth getting curious about. And I do think that on Tomoe, they look really, really nice mm. uh, on Triumph. They look nice too, but sure. the fact that they do shift makes me think what else could they look like on a bunch of other papers? Absolutely. So I'd be really curious to try this out. So this might be something you're interested in picking up some samples on and experimenting mm. on your own. You might find something that pleasantly surprises you. Pretty cool. It's a good thing because Sailor has got a pretty narrow range of colors. So, you know, it's nice that they're expanding a little bit. Right, yeah, because yeah. oh, we really need more Sailor inks. Absolutely, uh, it's absolutely. Just, <laughs> it's just such a famine of ink over in that that's brand. That's right, that's right. Speaking of Tomoe River, though, Brian, mm. if you want to ride the river, I'll tell you anyway. We have our own Goulet branded notebooks in A5 um, uh, pocket and passport sizes, mm -hmm. and they're all filled with Tomoe River. Yeah, they it's are. a very, 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 very nice paper. If you haven't heard of it, they generally come in 52 gram sizes, which is really, really thin, almost tracing paper feeling like, and then 68 gram, which feels less so. But both of them are very heavily mm -hmm. coated. So any ink you use kind of sits on top, dries very slowly. But if it has any fun elements like shimmer or sheen or some sort of chromo shading effect, yeah. it really shows it off. So right now that brand is undergoing a uh, transition as far as its manufacturing processes go. We're hoping to see some more come back into the market this calendar year. But for now, we still have the old stuff available in our Goulet notebooks, plenty of them available on our site. Yeah, so we stocked up. As soon as we heard that they were gonna be changing, we didn't know what that meant. We heard they were going away or changing or whatever. It was completely up in the air. So we were like, let's stock up. Let's make sure that we have them in our notebooks for a while, and I mean, we stocked up. So, so we're good. We do have plenty. So if you want some of the original stuff, we've got it, and it is a perfect companion for these Yurimiku inks, if that sounds like your jam. There you go. And I like to use it, I use the regular size. I've got a uh, traveler's notebook in a regular size, and I fill it with GBC notebooks, because the paper's thin. You know, the dry time is a little extended, but I don't use like super gushy broad nibs on it, because I use the dot grid, so it's five millimeter, and so I'm not using super gushy broad stuff anyway, because then you would need to take up like two lines yeah. to be able to actually read anything. Uh, and actually works really, really well. So yeah, big fan, personally. Not a surprise, maybe, because we put our name on it. Uh, but that's what we got for new stuff or slash old stuff, just things that we thought you might want to have some attention on. Uh, but now we're going to move on to some Q&A questions, and we got some good ones this week. All right, Brian, our first question this week comes mm. to us from Jess once again. And Jess asks us, has a manufacturer ever tried making mix and match parts to a pen? Mm. Imagine a demonstrator like a Twisby where you could buy different colored caps, nibs, clips, or even barrels to be able to adjust your pen to match your mood slash inks. Um, so I had to think about this one for a little bit because I know that there have been uh, like more independent manufacturers, like think of like the Kickstarter like type ones like Keras Customs and other ones like that where you can buy direct from them and you can sort of build your pen. Oh. So I didn't know if that's what Jess was asking about or whether it was more like literally you can just buy individual parts. Like if you wanted to buy, say buy like barrels in six different colors and then swap them out just on your single pen. Because that I have not really seen so much. Yeah. I've seen- I've never seen it at all. I've seen when you can buy direct from the manufacturer, you're essentially kind of like building a custom pen of sorts, like building a bespoke pen. Mm -hmm. And like certain companies, again, I'm thinking Keras Customs, but they've changed how they've done things in the last recent years. You know, certain companies have had extra parts that you can buy, whether it's replacement parts or if you want to use them as, <coughs> excuse me, as ones that you can like swap out. I got that little phlegm like thing hanging oh, back in my throat. Please describe that more. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely should. Our audio listeners are just like, Brian, clear your dang throat. Um, so anyway, the, the manufacturers that I've seen do that are more like the independent ones where you're buying direct. Yeah. I've never really seen anybody distribute like wholesale to retailers a lot of extra pen parts. It, like, have we ever s retailed 
like spare caps or clips or uh, barrels? We've had s- not really. No, no, um, not at all. No, just m- nibs. I think usually because you would you would have to design the pens differently to be able to swap them out. I think you could do it with this. If the eco, if you could buy eco caps and an eco uh, twisty thing, because these are made to be disassembled. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. Okay. you could just sell. I mean, not the rose gold one, but like the steel one would be more versatile. Uh-huh. But if Twisby sold just the cap and the knob, yeah, like as a set, like a you know brown cap knob, blue cap knob, brown. Mm. You could get brown. You if you wanted to, you could just go you're with a brown. You're saying the word brown a lot. What that concerns me. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but either way, if you wanted demand. a brown. Eco, you could get a brown eco by buying the brown knob and the brown cap. Theoretically, yes. And then that way, that. now it would be like, yeah, sure, this is not an expensive pen, but I'm saying a brown yeah. cap and a brown knob would probably be about, well, $11.99, I'm thinking. I have no idea. I feel like $11.99 is a good price. Do you feel like that's a good price? I do, yes. Using my background in manufacturing. Uh, <laughs> right. That is non-existent. But this would be a good pen to do that with. Hmm. Um, Maybe not so much like a Safari or anything because you're basically replacing the whole pen. Yeah. But with this. That's where it gets challenging. But with this, yeah. it's you're, you're still leaving most of the pen. So with this, it would make sense because mm-hmm. you're just just two parts. Totally change the type of pen because that's really all that is different between Eco to Eco. Yeah. Just those two parts. So Everything else is the same. Of the brands that I'm thinking about where I know they've had replacement parts, like Twisby, for some of their pens, they have grip sections, like the nib and grip section that you can get. And I guess technically you could you could buy one color of pen and buy a grip section for a different color and put that on there, sort of Franken pen it. Yeah, but those but are all, not, all those are clear though. The, grip, the the ones that they sell separate, those are always clear. Right. So, I mean, again, it's not designed for the purpose of what I think Jess is getting at yeah. here. It's like, has anybody designed- I don't think so. Designed a pen for the purpose of like customizing and swapping out all the parts. and. For one, I think that's pretty specific and people would want, you know, a lot of color options. And then to, in order to do that, the basically every SKU that you come out with, which, you know, a product, an, an individual pen, like with a given nib size, that is one, you know, SKU. Um, there's costs associated with creating that. You got to create UPCs, you got to register, you got to distribute all those. And there's, it's, it's pretty involved. So there are inherent kind of fixed costs with offering any product at any price that you're going to have to charge more than you would think just to offer that spare part. Mm-hmm. That's why, like, frankly, our spare nibs and stuff that we have for other brands, you know, they're like half the cost or maybe even more than yeah. the pen itself. It's not just because that nib costs, but there's all the distribution costs like to that buy go a, along with like it. Like if you then. went to Lamy Germany and wanted to buy a Lamy 2000 nib, you're basically buying the pen. I feel like it's Pretty only, much, I want to yeah. say like I've looked into it and it's not that big a difference. Right. It's like way more affordable. Now the vanishing point- Well, that, nib, that, nibs are a little different because gold is really expensive. Right. So disproportionately nibs, yeah, sure. But I mean, if you wanted to get just a spare cap for a given pen, right? Like there's- I mean, there's some of the cost of the pen of that in the cap, mm-hmm. but most of the cost is going to be in like the filling mechanism, the nib, all that kind of stuff in terms of like raw materials. So what you're saying is this is a good stuff. idea with the eco. I'm saying you're it's, describing this. It's an idea. Yes. 11.99. It's, it's a, all it takes, it's a Brian. potentially feasible. I don't know that it would be 11.99. I think we'd be probably be looking more Trust at like me. twenty dollars for me. a cap, maybe more. No, I mean really. All right, all right. This is this is what like twenty eight something like that. Uh, more than that now. It's uh, 30, 30, 32. 32. Yeah. All right. So, hmm. I'm thinking 1199. <laughs> you can think that all you want, Drew. But uh, yeah, especially brown. All right. Brown. All right. But you might have to oh, dis- dis- discount the brown because I don't think the demand right, would be you, there. Right, let, let's just say hypothetical. <laughs> we, we've established that such a pen does not exist. Other, sure. than, other than the eco, sure. can you think of a pen in the modern market that would actually be a good candidate for something like this? Um, so the difficult part is with most pens, like this one is kind of unique because- Twisby, Do I need Twisby, to get the goo, the goo tube? Kinda, you probably could, should. <laughs> We're like halfway through the tube already. Um, the problem is most pens are not really made to be taken apart and have their parts swapped. Okay, so what one would be conducive? The most conducive one that we currently sell. What Jeez, do you think? I don't know, man. Probably, I mean, Twisby's not a bad one. Uh, because there are parts and they give you the wrench and all that kind of stuff. So what about a 2000? Let's say, so 2000, the 2000 is like, you know, right in that. There's only of, one color. Like, well, no, the, remember the steel thing though? 
when I when I frankenpinned the steel and the macaron sure, together, sure. You could you could say like, hey, let me buy a you know a polycarbonate one, okay. but then for an additional fee, rather than buying a new steel two thousand, you could say seventy five bucks, I get a steel cap and a steel um uh. Wait, no, no, it's just the cap. It's just the cap. That could make it look cool. Uh, sure. I don't think it would be. I'm 70, trying to I help you. Seventy five bucks. Make though. a decision, Brian. I think this. I think it would end up being like hundred and seventy five for that cap. Oh, really? That pen is $400, Drew, the stainless uh, steel one. Oh, yeah. It's significantly more expensive. Yeah, all right. So, yeah, I'm just, I'm saying like. There's got to be something out there. I, I think that when you get into dealing with pen parts, first off, a lot of pens are not designed to be taken apart to that right. level. A lot of them are like the pieces are fit together because to make them last, you, you really want them to like screw in together and fit. And they're not really made to be taken apart and put back together a lot. So you would inherently be limited in terms of which pens you could even offer that on or you'd have to design a pen specifically for that purpose. And yeah. then you would end up with this really chunky, clunky looking thing because you'd need to put like big fat threads that would hold up over the time of doing and undoing all the time. You'd end up with looking, you know, with something that looks like it was made for like kids to take apart and put back together. Like it would not be super appealing in my opinion mm. for the way you probably have to design that. And then to have all these different spare parts with the, all the different SKUs and stuff, like I just don't think that people would pay that for all the compromises you'd have to make to offer this as an option i just don't think it would in execution end up looking like what you would hope it would be which is why it probably doesn't exist yeah you're probably right i can understand how it'd be why no one else has tried to do it, it they, they're, uh, it's probably been tried yeah i was like, about found, to say they, you know, they probably thought about it probably but then they probably, probably hit the roadblocks that you're describing and yeah. to be like yeah no shut it down and, and part of the challenge too like we've talked to independent pen makers who sell things direct and they have you know way more options to like build your own pen that kind of thing you know and we talked to them and they're like yeah 80 percent of the people order the same stuff like it's there's a long tail of all these extra, you know, additional colors and swappable pieces. You disproportionately get so few people who want each of those things that it gets really tough, the economics of it, to be able to offer it. So I think there's just a number of different challenges that add into that that I just don't think it makes as much sense. So that's why you have ink that you can put in there and you can change your ink up. And, you know, you can always get multiple versions of the same pen. You can mix and match kind of your own parts so you know you can get twisbees of different colors and you can swap the pieces between those models that's true but in terms of like being able to buy spare cap and all this stuff like honestly for all the logistics that would be involved in the parts it probably makes as much sense to just buy a second pen of a different color and swap parts between them mm. and then you're getting the best bang for your buck doing it that way anyway sorry it's just one of these things that like all right, well what, here I don't know. All right. I still think if they did a brown... <laughs> Crushing Drew's dreams If they here. had a brown cap and a brown knob, they wouldn't have to sell it on a pen because maybe brown's not that popular. Maybe just some people maybe. want it. And maybe, maybe Twisby could save some money by not packaging and you know, distributing with the box and everything. They could just put it in a little sandwich. They still have to put it in something. A little sandwich bag. What are you That says Twi Twi Drew. Twi Twisby's not... <laughs> Twisby's not going to put something in a sandwich bag. So that's the thing. Yeah, packaging. You would have to, you would have to create packaging for each of these You're objects. You're breaking my heart, right? I am definitely God. raining on your parade right now. All over but, my parade. All right. Mm. It's been painful enough. I this think the ooze tube has run out on that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I do have a question here from Karis. I would like to know, Karis? Karis? How do you pronounce that? I don't know. Kar Karis. I don't know. I don't know. Either way, it sounds like I'm saying it wrong. Let me know in the comments. You're K usually K -A -R -I -S. there. K-A-R-I-S. Maybe it's something different. I don't know. Anyway, I'm sorry. I would like to know what happens when I place an order. I place an order on the website. What happens then? Who takes care of what? We get these cards, very nice by the way, that says who packaged the order, but what happens in between and how does it get started? Karis has a lot of questions here, apparently. Did, did so, Karis yeah. actually say the Goulet Pen Company? Because mm, I don't know. Could be talking about anybody. Maybe Karis is just naturally a very curious person. So uh, anyway, we use the opportunity to actually show some different folks. Here I, went, I went on helping. site, Brian. I went out into the field. <laughs> into the field. Field reporter. There you go. Drew, the field reporter here. So um, Drew walked around, talked to some of the folks on our team uh, just to show you like, yeah, there is a lot of magic that happens behind the scenes uh, to get you all your wonderful orders. You know, just like snap your finger and it happens. All right. So, so I'd like to go to uh, Drew Brown uh, in the field doing... <laughs> Field work. All yeah. right, uh, Drew. Back to, over to, to you. Okay, so I am back in the warehouse now. I've teleported back here, and I'm going to get to the bottom of what exactly happens when you place an order and where it goes. But first, I need to show you where we store all of our uh, Pilot Con 40 converters because. 
That makes sense, right? Con. Um, let's see. We've got. There's Micah. Hi, Micah. Hi, Micah. And Jamelia. Hello, Jamelia. Hey. How you doing? Where's Katie? Katie. I need help. I need help. I need knowledge. And I believe I believe you have it. So we got a question about what happens when someone places an order on our website. And uh, you do that, right? I do. I do that every day. Super. So when someone places an order, hey, Brandon. Does, I'm, is Brandon doing order things right now? Look at him go. He has a cart full of totes, and he is picking a batch of orders currently. So does that come through with paper or is it some other witchcraft? It doesn't. We used to use paper for order picking and order fulfilling, but now we have gone digital. So. <gasps> Brandon, you are digital now? Is that what that black thing is right there? Some sort of digital witch? <gasps> Look at that. And do you just kind of like mosey around any which way or is there a particular way things get pulled? Uh, we start with aisle one and then we just do like a big S zigzag all the way through. That sounds very efficient, Katie. It is. Is that a new thing or is that an old thing? It's a newer thing. We started uh, two years ago ish. And so we're using Ship Hero and picking and fulfilling our orders all digitally. That so we sounds. Are saving so much paper in this process. And you're not going all which way over the warehouse. You're starting. Like, so they pull multiple orders per cart, right? Yes, the old way we used to pick one order at a time. We would get the invoice with the packing slip. We would go and we would go through the whole warehouse, pick the order, and then send it through the process. But now we can pick up to 50 orders at one time. You fit 50 one orders on that cart? We can. Wow, it doesn't seem like you could fit that many. 50 bins. It's fulfillment magic. Whoa, that's pretty cool. And then we've got aisles here. And look at him. He's, he's zigzagging, just like he said he was doing. He didn't fib at me. All right. And then so Brandon will just mosey all up and down and up and down until all. So that those aren't 50, right? He doesn't have 50 on there right now, does he? 21. 20. Oh, wow. You already knew that. So he will just mosey all down each one of these. Zigging and zagging. Zagging and zigging. The aisles. Until he has them all pulled, right? Absolutely. Oh, look. It's Sandy. Hi, how's Sandy today? I'm great, thank you. Super, me too, me too. I love coming back here, love seeing people. So now we are going down to the end of the aisles towards our shipping area. Ooh, look at this, shipping stuff. Do, do you use this conveyor anymore? We use it in the holidays because it is very efficient to pick our orders, send them down, and as you see, we have three shipping stations along the conveyor for optimal efficiency. Cool. And we've got a fan too, in case things get a little toasty. But we this is a very nicely climate controlled warehouse, I will say. Oh, absolutely. We've got heating and cooling. We have these lovely LED lights. Ah! We have all of these mats. Cozy, so cozy floor mats. So once Brandon has all his stuff pulled, they will be on one of these carts and then he will begin packing it or does a different person pack it? We go back and forth, but currently we are having folks picking and shipping their own order. So there's fewer touch points and they're using their own totes, their own equipment during, you know, these times where it's better to, you know, not be sharing a lot of equipment. Well, so. what if Brandon pulls the wrong thing? Well, that's okay. We have on our picking application here, a process to kind of go back in QC um, just to make sure that we are sending out the correct thing because sending out your accurate shipment is very important. That is, yeah, that's super terrible. That's but inaccurate. Now, I have heard that we are actually pretty darn good at making sure we always send out the right stuff. Like, we've got a pretty astonishingly low error rate when, where that's going, right? Absolutely, we do. That's rocking. I like that a lot. Um, so, I don't know if you know, Katie, but we are recording this a little early. But when this publishes, it will be Earth Day today. Earth Day! Earth Day! Um, and we are not totally ignoring our... Planet Earth, right? We've got some packing stuff that is very Earth conscious, right? Do you know a lot about that? We do. Um, we have boxes, we have paper void, but we actually have someone who is very knowledgeable. Is it Adam? It is Adam. Is I that think Adam? You should go find Let's him. go find Adam. You're running. Adam. You're a scamper. Adam. <laughs> hey. Um, scampering, it's true. I, uh, I usually do scamper. Hey, I want to ask some questions about some. Sure. Packing supplies and green green stuff, yeah, but not not this wall. Like different green stuff. Like, oh, yeah. 
other oh, green yeah. stuff. Yeah, follow me. I don't know where I'm going. I'm walking backwards. Don't that's let me get hurt, Adam. That's not up to OSHA standards. Yeah, well. Um, okay, so we don't use a ton of bubble wrap, as I see. I mean, we used to have bubble wrap everywhere, and now I don't yeah. even see it, like, yeah, we, at all. When I started almost 10 years ago, we pretty much exclusively used bubble wrap. We had some paper that we were using, but... Um, Primarily, we were using bubble wrap, and over the past few years, we've tried to be more conscious about uh, what we're putting out with our orders uh, and thinking more about uh, sustainability. So we have reduced, not completely eliminated, uh, but uh, we have started in the past few years to use these paper machines, and uh, we're trying to drill down to, as a team, how much stuff we're sending out with paper uh, void fill. And what I can say is that last month, um, I'm sure it's higher than this number, but what I can say is that we definitively sent about 68% of our orders with only paper. Dang. And I know it's, 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 I know it's higher than that number because we have folks who exclusively now only use paper void fill in an effort to just reduce the amount of plastics that we're sending out. Now, is that as safe as using plastic? Because yeah, yeah, that's a really great question because we struggle with that early on. Like one thing that we take a lot of pride in and we put on our, our packer cards is that we like to pack with a slightly ridiculous amount of care. I've heard that. Um, so letting go of those old standards was a tough thing, um, but we like to lead with the data. Um, so we, we do measure uh, feedback coming in from customers. Uh, how often are we getting reports of breakages? And it's... What's the result? It's very, I mean... It's Negligible? Very, very yeah, I, and our shipping accuracy is like ninety nine point like eight percent. So we're so like that. That's like the amount of times we send out wrong items. No, that's how often we get it right. Oh, okay. So no, that's what I mean. Like, so obviously yeah, we don't send out ninety nine percent wrong. <laughs> yeah. So like, so so that's insane. So like, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and a lot of that's just that like, we've got a, a, a tenured and skilled team who care a lot about the work that we do. We care about our customers. We want to serve people well. Um, that's really rad. So after everything gets checked, so everything gets scanned, right? Is that is that that's how it gets checked? If you uh, you like beep the beep the barcode here. Yeah, exactly. Beep, beep, the, barcode. beep the barcode. We beep the barcodes, and that that creates. That I know amazing. all the things about this clearly. Um, you know, something else I'll call attention to. Not only just the the, the paper packing that we're doing, but we are uh, looking for opportunities where we can actually source boxes that are um, from sustainable resources. So. Uh, we sent out a lot, a lot of these bad boys with our own branding and whatnot, and I'm sure some folks have seen this. But whoa, 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 how did you just open that? Uh, it, it's a cool little auto lock. What? Like BAM feature. Whoa. Um, yeah, we specifically got it for that reason. No, uh, that just, it's, it's small things help create efficiencies in processes uh, like these. So they add up. That's that, that little bit of time there, not taping the bottom of the box really adds up. Uh, and this is sourced from a business um, called Pratt. Uh, and this box is 100% uh, made from 100% post-consumer uh, fiber. And we sell a lot of small things, so that box goes out a lot, right? That box goes out a lot. You know, pens, samples. We use that almost more than uh, it's one of our top three. I can say that as far as nice. So, are. so a super s sustainable box going out that often, you know, like like you just said, it, it adds up, right? Absolutely. Fantastic. So once everything is beeped and booped and checked. Um, then the packing happens, right? Yeah. And you were saying that most of the time we use the paper when we can. Um, yeah. Shouldn't more be coming out of that? Yeah, more should be coming out of that. Do you have to whack? There we go. We just got that service. Nice. <laughs> that. that was supposed to be a, a cool moment. <laughs> hey, I thought it was cool. I thought it was cool. Um, so when do you use that blue plasticky wrappy stuff? Uh, so, you know, we do send out liquids with, with the ink. So we want to be mindful of that. Uh, people aren't having a, an experience where their pens or their paper are getting ruined by leaky bottles. Ah. Um, so we do use this primarily if, if someone is ordering a lot of different inks. Uh, one thing that we have transitioned to doing more of is actually using these um, resealable bags for our inks. Because if someone only orders one or two bottles of inks, we'll put it in here. Now, uh, recycling with plastic can be a bit difficult. Yeah. You know, so if you're getting a local pickup or a curbside pickup, some of that stuff may not be able to be recycled by uh, facilities in your area. Um, so that's where with this, e even if it's not something that you can recycle, it is at least something that is reusable. So we're trying to look at that aspect too. Like, okay, we can't completely eliminate the plastic. Um, and we are thinking more critically about how we can reduce um, our use of plastic. Then we're sending these out. The blue wrap, you know, that's really, if, if it's a lot of ink, 
we will wrap those up just to make sure that it doesn't leak and ruin your experience. Right, because if it leaks and ruins it, then we send out a replacement, which again, that, that's carbon footprint right there. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. There's a lot of things to weigh when you're thinking about sustainability and renewable resources. Like it's it's the whole chain. Mm-hmm. Um, so and we are, th- you know, we're thinking more critically about that. Um, so once things get packed up and you get the packer card in there, at that point we just throw everything into a cage. Yep. And is that it, or am I missing something? No, that's it. Wow. Okay. Got it. This is a pretty solid process here, Adam. Not bad. Did I take you away from something important? No, I was just trying to think if there's anything else that I, I could uh, mention. Uh, I guess the only thing that I will say is, you know, one of our mission is to prove that business can be personal. So if anyone's looking for a specific experience or there's something that you want individually, like you can always just put that in an org comment and we will work to the best of our ability to fulfill anyone's requests or desires. Because again, like our, our wish is to serve our customers, serve the people who are passionate about these products, bring a smile to their face, and uh, serve not only our customers, uh, but also, you know, the planet that we live on. Well, anyway. Absolutely. We're all here together. Fantastic. Well, happy Earth Day, Adam. Yeah, happy Earth Day. And thank you for joining me and uh, helping to educate everyone. And uh, if anybody would like to know more, Adam has plenty of other things in that brain of his as far as packing goes. So if you want another video on this, we could probably accommodate that. Certainly, couldn't we? Yeah, certainly. Awesome. All righty, Katie, thank you so very much. Happy Earth Day. I everyone. appreciate your time, and I'm sure everybody else does as well. Brandon. Birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that report, Drew. <laughs> um, that was really great reporting from Drew. Yes, top top tier reporting going on there. That's the right. Do you have an earpiece in your ear? Yeah. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. Or do you have an earache or something? All know. of the above. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so there you go. Great stuff to see. You know, we're honestly, we planned on doing something more in depth. We've actually been planning it for a while, but with the whole pandemic thing going on, we were like, well, this is not really our normal process anyway. So we've been waiting for things to get kind of back to normal. So this is like a little foray into that. If y'all are interested in knowing in even more detail, like how we, you know, do our packing process and stuff like that, um, we have plans to do something a little more in depth, give us some enthusiasm around it. That'll motivate us more to uh, show you that. But this is a little... A little teaser on your palette here, a little a little sampler. And we only there. had a few people there when I did that today. Um, mm-hmm. We usually have more people back there, and all of them are just delightful human beings with a ton of personality. And uh, we have very pleasant humans yeah. in this building. Yeah, good stuff. Well, thanks for doing that, Drew. You're very your, welcome. Your field reporting skills are bar none. He says thank you. <laughs> what a dork! <laughs> all right, you want to take the next one? All right, um, Lauren sent us a message, not Warren. Not Warren. This is Lauren. 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 All right. And Lauren asks, why do almost all pen retailers market their pens as being less than MSRP? Hmm. That is manufacturer suggested retail price? That is what it stands for. Yeah. If everyone, Brian, is Mm. selling at this discounted Mm -hmm. price, is it really a discount? That's a good Do you have an question. answer for I think, us? I think I have an answer. Well, bring it. Oh, I will. Uh, okay, so uh, yes, the answer is yes, it is a discount. Uh, so, you know, MSRP, Manufacturer Suggested Retail Price, um, you know, it can be somewhat of a confusing, possibly misleading price, particularly <laughs> if you're seeing something, I don't know, we live in the age of online commerce and pretty much anybody can source out some product made by whoever, put it on an online marketplace, say that it's a suggested retail price of whatever they want, and then put the actual price. So you can mark it up 20 times what anybody would ever pay for it. And you can make it look like there's a deep discount. Certainly that happens a lot in other industries, but the fountain pen industry is pretty established and and generally speaking is pretty straightforward. Um, So the manufacturer suggested retail price, basically the way that works is that is a price that's set by the manufacturer, not surprisingly, Um, but actually our costs as a retailer buying it wholesale is tied to that suggested retail price. So, um, so that's kind of like the core price in a lot of ways. Like everything's kind of like attached to that. Yeah, it's, I mean, it is, it is somewhat of an arbitrary number because each manufacturer has to peg each product 
at a suggested retail price. And that can vary depending on their own economies of scale based on the marketplace and where that pen is priced and what other comparable things you know, from other manufacturers might be there. So there's a lot of things that can influence what that number should actually be. And so while yes, you can sort of make that number to be whatever you want, you know, any established manufacturer is going to try to have something that's reasonable and sensical, you know, that would make sense in the marketplace, if you will, for whatever that product is. You know, if you're going to buy a car, you know, you're going to have what's the sticker price or the mm -hmm. MSRP for that car. Right. You know, and that's, you're, you're, you might end up paying a different price at each dealership. You know, but it's all kind of pegged around where that suggested retail price it's is. It's a starting point. Yeah, it's a starting point. It kind of just pegs like, here's what this car is sort of valued to be. And it may be up or down depending on a lot of different factors from there. But what I can say is as a retailer, we're paying a fixed price for these goods. You know, so that MSRP does, you know, have a heavy influence on what that, I mean, the truth is they're dictating <laughs> the, the sale price to us. And then the suggested retail price, they can't necessarily dictate what we have to sell the pen for, but that is what they are heavily recommending. Uh, so there is definitely a relationship there. And if basically, if you're, if you're selling as a retailer below that manufacturer suggested retail price, it's a discount because you're discounting what they are suggesting. Even if everybody else does it, that's still a discount because they're pegging it at you know, where they think it is in the marketplace. And the truth is in the fountain pen world, especially in the online world where we are, you can just quickly do a search and come up with a lot of different retailers and quickly see what prices they have, which maybe oddly enough, maybe not. Um, you're going to see a lot of people with the pens at the same price because it's competition. Like it's a free marketplace. And if one person has a lower price and they get everybody else's business, everybody else is going to going to want to go down to that price too. So the very nature of online retails in fountain pens and everywhere else means that competition gets stiffer, which means that prices generally will go down. Now, the challenge with that is there's a lot of physical brick and mortar pen stores too. Like fountain pens have been around for 150 years. So there's a long established brick and mortar store base for these products where, you know, people weren't necessarily going to drive halfway across the world to go and get a pen $20 cheaper than they would in their local town. So the MSRP was a little more, I don't know, meaningful, substantial for those brick and mortar stores because there's overhead, there's people coming into the stores and stuff like that. Now we have overhead here, here as an online store as well. But I think that just because there was perhaps less competition with some of those things in a local brick and mortar store, the suggested retail price maybe, you know, was adhered to a little bit more. And then maybe there was like negotiating one-on-one -on -one that would happen. Well, in an online retail marketplace, you're not having as much of that one-on-one -on -one negotiation. You don't have as much of a captive audience as a retailer. You know, people are coming to your website, they might be there for 30 seconds and then they leave and they go and check all the other stores. So, you know, prices, you know, a little less of a, I don't know, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say there, but it's 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 something that's uh, easier to check at a lot of other places. So you have to stand out in other ways, or you know you have to pretty much be in line with where everybody else is. So basically, ever since we got into the fountain pen business back in 2009, 2010, um, pretty much we saw discount off some MSRP being kind of a standard, uh, usually about 20% off. Um, now, why did it settle at 20%? Some of it is that sort of what naturally ended up happening in the pen world. Um, but, uh, you have the, you know, the MSRP, what basically the manufacturer is suggesting a price should be at. Um, but there's another thing that's maybe not as publicized, um, called the minimum advertised price. So that's basically the, I don't know what the, the lowest price that a manufacturer wants to see retailers advertising, like in the old pre-internet days, this would have been things in print catalogs and mailers and basically anything where you're just like blasting the price out there to the world. Right. You're sort of saying, okay, well, here's a suggested price, but this is the street price. Like you, you can't will. go below this when you're sending out your pamphlets and flyers. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, yes, a manufacturer can establish their suggested retail price, 
but ultimately the value and the brand equity of that brand is going to be tied to what's a pen actually selling for, right? And if there is a huge discrepancy between the suggested retail price and what the pen's actually selling for or any product is actually selling for, well, if there's a big discrepancy, then that's going to ultimately devalue the positioning of the brand overall. And that's not I mean, that seems really good, you know, as a consumer, but then, you know, basically if you have retailers that are all kind of doing a race to the bottom, trying to just get business purely based on price, well, that means that they're not going to have the profit margins to do things like produce videos for free and put them out on YouTube and or stay in business own, to stay in business <laughs> at all, or do the updated specifications and take their own pictures and, you know, do all of the things that require overhead. Uh, if we, um, you know, have using our, I'm really not trying to like be a holier than thou kind of a thing, but like we have real costs with all the extra things that we try to do as a retailer. And if it was just completely wide open out there and literally we were competing with the entire world for lowest price and manufacturers did not put any kind of a floor on it, Ugh. then it would absolutely bring quality of service down. It would bring quality of the product down because it would be a total free for all. And ultimately it would devalue the brand. And for the long term, then the brands would, their reputation would go under and it would not be good overall. So obviously I'm very, very biased in that, but just even look, I'm a consumer in many areas of my life. And I recognize this as well. Like if you're buying shoes, you're buying whatever, a coffee mug, like you're, you're paying significantly more than just the base cost of what it takes to manufacture this thing, you know, but there's a lot more that goes into it than just what the cost of manufacturing that thing was. There's R and D there's marketing, there's branding, there's customer support, warranty. There's all kinds of other things that go into making that the viable product that it is. And the problem is if you don't put any kind of a floor on that, it drives it down and then retailers can't afford the time to support the product like they want. The brand value goes way down and ultimately everybody uh, ends up getting affected by that in the long term. Now, there are some, you know, as I think, you know, going back to the original question about if everybody does it, is it really a discount? Mm -hmm. um, not every product. Not everybody does it. Well, yeah. also not every product is even allowed to go 20 off. No, it's really up to the manufacturer a lot. We, to we, set that. We, I'm sure we have some stuff that we sell for sure. full MSRP yeah. to be based on the request of the manufacturer or um, uh, distributor, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, yes, MSRP is somewhat somewhat arbitrary to a degree, but again, it is, it is pretty reliable, you know, in the fountain pen world, they're not just making numbers up, um, you know, from talking to a lot of manufacturers directly, they're all very cognizant of where pens fit in the marketplace. And again, because fountain pens are very established and they know the pen community talks to each other, so they can't just make everything up. Um, so there's, there's a lot of validity there to it, but Ultimately, it matters what the pen sells for. So there are some brands that say, you know, our minimum advertised price is the MSRP. Yeah. Like there is no kind of acceptable discount in there. And that's for that's for authorized retailers as well. I mm -hmm. think it's important to maybe note that to be an authorized retailer, you're agreeing to basically, you know, all the stuff that the, the brand wants you to do. There are unauthorized retailers out there selling in ways or getting their hands on product not direct from the manufacturer or they're selling things not to the manufacturer's wishes that are kind of going rogue and doing whatever they want. And that creates its own challenges. But, you know, that's maybe sometimes why you see prices that can be kind of all over the place because, you know, people might be acquiring pens through their own means and then they can kind of do whatever they want and the brand can't really do much about it, um, you know, or they, you know, whatever. There's a lot, of, a lot of different factors like that. But as an authorized retailer, you know, we live in this place uh, where we want to, you know, do the best service for you all as customers and educate and do all the good support stuff. But at the same time, we want to represent the manufacturer to their wishes as well. So we are, we are trying to please, you know, the end fountain pen user as well as the manufacturer and bring the two together really, you know, have the best of, of all worlds for both. Uh, I think that's the important role that a, a good retailer plays, but that takes time, that takes energy. And that's why we have, you know, some margin built into these products because of all that overhead that is involved in doing that. So um, ultimately to get back to like the nature of the question, if everybody discounts it, first off, not everybody does necessarily, but 
with a lot of direct competition, which online absolutely is, a lot of algorithms in Google search and Amazon and everything, they literally will only serve up the lowest price. So it's not even a matter of you know, choice for a lot of places. If you wanna be in that marketplace, you are kind of forced to be in that way. Um, but uh, a lot of it has to do with that direct price that the manufacturer is choosing. And if you're an authorized retailer, you gotta, you gotta kind of go with that. Now we, we could always choose to go you know, full MSRP, even if others are discounting, that gets challenging because then essentially we're being viewed as charging a premium. But technically, you're not charging a premium until you're charging over MSRP. Like if you're buying a new car right now, it's ridiculous. Yeah. You're going to pay a premium. You're going to pay over MSRP. And a lot of dealers are actually having a problem with that. Like the manufacturers like Ford and others are having problem with some dealers because they're charging like double MSRP for new cars. Like it's getting ridiculous because supply is so low, but it's hurting the brand because who's going to pay like, I'm not joking, like $100,000 for like a Honda Civic. Like that's what I'm hearing some of these cars are selling for. It's crazy. Like some of these like special sport editions and stuff, you oh, can't get them. God. So it's like the brands are like, this is not good for the brand. This is not, we're not trying to be a premium brand or whatever, but if the dealers are going crazy, you know, so you gotta, as an authorized retailer of anything, you gotta be cognizant of that. So there are some some boundaries and some things, some things in place there, uh, but yeah, anyway. Maybe this is too much inside baseball for everybody, but we kind of live in this world and maybe you can explain a little bit of that to you. I hope that answers your question some, but that was definitely a, uh, a news tube question as that well. That was a news tube question. We'll try and move it along a little more on these ones, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll wrap that up for this one and we'll move on to uh, Gorov's question and I'll let you take this one away, Drew. Uh, if the Japanese inks are not recommended to be used in the vintage sack filled fountain pens due to their alkalinity, then how come it's not a problem to use with the modern pilot converters that have sacks in them like the Con B and the Con 20? I think this is a really good question. It is. And it is a reference to a previous discussion we had in episode 37 mm -hmm. of the Goulet Pencast where someone asked if it was safe to use Iroshizuku inks by pilot in mm -hmm. celluloid pens. We kind of discussed right. celluloid's fragility mm -hmm. in that question. And uh, as we said then, I will say this again now, we have been selling Iroshizuku inks since I've been working here. So yeah. over 10 years. And most of those 10 years, I was working in the customer care department. And I definitely would have heard if there was a pervasive issue of Iroshizuku inks damaging any sort of pen. And I have not heard of one. Maybe one came through in some point in the last decade and it went to some of my team members, not to me. But I guarantee you, if there was any sort of large scale issue we would know about it and we just do not. So it's definitely not a large scale issue. Granted, bladders are not the norm in fountain pens. So, mm -hmm. but still, I, I'm certain that people have been using them in vintage sack fillers and being just fine. It's very likely what is happening is that uh, at some point, or maybe even still currently, the type of sack fillers in these vintage pens uh, have been used with the Rosuzuku or some other inks with similar properties and maybe didn't hold up super well. But obviously, they're not new sack fillers. So A, they have, they're going to have varying degrees of use and wear mm. put upon them. And perhaps whatever is made uh, of, whatever the Roshizuka inks are made of, might make cracked or somewhat flawed vintage sacks a little bit more susceptible to damage. Mm. But obviously, those bladders are not being manufactured in the same way as modern bladders are at all. I'm certain that they're using different materials and obviously Pilot is not going to produce converters using something that their own inks are going to damage. So hmm. just to get right out of it, right out in front of your question, absolutely no, it is not at all bad to use the Rosuzuku inks in Pilot's own converters for sure. Um, mm -hmm. They, uh, you know, um, they're probably taking into consideration the impact on older, older, older bladder fillers, which Brian and I are not super educated on as far as what they are made by or what yeah. they are made of. And it is it is tough because obviously when vintage pens were made, they could not have any guidance or explanation about future inks that didn't yet exist. No. And, you know, especially if these brands are not even making the pens anymore, there is very little guidance that official guidance that can be had about which modern inks 
are like safe or good to use in vintage pens. So And it might not even be the sacks themselves. It might be an issue that's with what I the, wonder. That's what it I might wonder. be an issue with the shellac or whatever sort of adhesive they use to actually adhere the sacks. It could be a number mm -hmm. of different things. Mm -hmm. But could be. bottom line, absolutely not. They do not damage in any way. Uh, li literally, we don't the sell ones, any yeah. any inks that would like damage any products that we currently sell. Staining, yeah, probably, but actual damage, like none of the inks we sell melt any of the pens we sell, right. or, or you know make any of the pens yeah. we sell break down think, or decompose. Or anything I think where like Gorov was going with that, I, th I don't think he was debating necessarily the whether that is happening, but it was more just like, why is it a difference between the vintage and the modern? That's just the way That's it's made, materials, at. you know? Yeah, I, I legitimately don't know if it's like the rubber or the shellac or something about it is different now than it used to be. I would have to imagine. Absolutely. Probably. Yeah. Like, I don't know if the, the sacks that- you know, Like what is manufactured in the same way that it was during, I, you know, mid-century? Yes. Nothing. That's a really good point. But I mean, like, I don't know, shellac, Shellac is a natural material. It comes from the lac bug. So like, unless there's some way that it's processed and there are different But even still, I'm sure that modern, like modern, that, uh, modern sacks are not being shellac. They're probably being adhered with some other way. I have no idea. There are no modern, like, th yeah, they're not using shellac in a con B. Right, and they're probably, not using, they're probably not using it in the uh, Conklin Crescent Filler either. It's probably I'm some other sure sort of adhesive. I'm sure they're not. No. Yeah, no. So yeah, it could it's be a, a shellac. It's a, we know. are in a different manuscape, manu, manuscape mm. manufacturing landscape. Okay. I just combine those two words. Well, so like the, the like where this comes from is from people who are into vintage pens, restoring them, you know, nib, nib people, pen restorers, stuff like that. And they're, they're legitimately seeing pens with damaged parts. Like I'm not, I don't think that anybody's like lying or malintended no, no, no. or anything. Like, you know, and if they're being told by the customer who sends them the pen to repair, I've only ever used whatever Conpecky or whatever ink, you know, what are they going to think? Oh, this ink destroyed this pen or destroyed this sack or whatever. So like there is this like kind of somewhat confusing, contentious kind of thing because the, the folks who are doing this restoration stuff, they will say very conclusive things based on what they see and what they're hearing from customers who are using these pens that like this ink has harmed this pen, but also like we are, <laughs> we are selling a lot of this ink, and we're just not hearing this at any kind of a scale. No, I spoke any with kind of a um, scale. Brian that Gray it's harming over at, pens. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We have not. Mm -hmm. I spoke with Brian Gray over at Edison Pens, and he doesn't recommend using Hiroshizuku for the bladders that he uses. But which is mo he makes modern pens, right? Yes, but he does use you know a type of rubber from I don't know where now he uses he creates you know not necessarily a sack but he actually uses like it's more of like a, a diaphragm that compresses okay and you know I have no idea what he's using but he might actually be using shellac or he might be using a more hard to obtain rubber but no so idea. but again he's as we know super trustworthy totally trust everything sure. he's saying but in our experience it's certainly not an issue with anything that we sell yeah, so I would say, you know, if you're looking to use it in vintage pens or whatever, like, again, it's it's hard to say because the people who are restoring these, like Brian Gray's in a unique position because he's sourced that out, he's tested it. So he can say, I do not recommend using such and such an ink in this pen because that's what he's seeing. Like, he's he a, is he's a very safe. Yeah. Like he might yeah. not have even seen any damage. It might just be because he's heard something, but he's a very, very safe person. He's yeah. not gonna he's not going to take risks with this product. So he can be an authority on that. But the thing that makes this even more confusing is like, is it the alkalinity or is it something else? We don't have a full breakdown of what is these inks are made of, or a full breakdown of whatever, especially vintage pens, that are the sacks, the shellac, whatever it is. So it is difficult to know what actually is causing the problem. You know, for vintage pens especially, is it just the age? Is it the rubber breaks down over time and that the pen would, brand new would have been perfectly fine with this ink, but after 30 years of sitting around, that rubber is more brittle and then it will be susceptible with certain inks. It's hard to say. And, and even, even with a certain brand of ink, their alkalinity is gonna be all over the place. Or it could just speaking. be, the, and we've talked about this before, like with you know base state inks, they only get mm -hmm. truly dangerous when they come into contact with other inks. So oh, they're non-base states, right? Well, the same thing could be true with any inks. If if one ink doesn't mm -hmm. play well with another ink, you could have some residual ink in yeah. there. And then once you introduce a Roshizuku or whatever, all of a sudden you might have an issue on your hands because of the yeah. blend. So there are we all I know we always say this, but there are so many variables at play that could, you know, be 
resulting in an issue, yeah. but uh, we, we just have no way of knowing. But we can say confidently that Orochizuku inks do not harm the modern converters that Pilot produces or any modern yeah. uh, uh, bladder filler. Yeah, so I would say, you know, I'm sorry we only have but so much information and insight into this. All we can say is like what we practically seen, I don't think there's all that much to be worried about unless you have a vintage pen that's particularly meaningful. You want to not even come close to, you know, having any kind of an incident. Then, you know what, if you hear basically from anywhere that maybe you shouldn't use this ink in that pen just don't there's so many other ink alternatives out there you can find something that's pretty darn close and just don't use that ink in that pen use that ink in your other pens you know it's not this big scandalous thing if certain inks maybe for a few people don't play well in a certain pen and it just gives you caution that's okay some of this is like there you want to dive in and solve this mystery but i mean we've we tried to dive in on some of this stuff there's just not great information out there especially the vintage stuff that the company's not even around anymore and right. making it you're only going to get so much info but if you have so info play it safe let us know because we'd love to open up a discussion to this because this is something we'd love to learn more about if you have some brain thinkings for yeah. us but it's interesting I, I am curious about like ph and alkalinity there's a lot of pens inks that are very acidic too and it's like there's going to be things that that has an impact on so i don't know it's very curious but anyway that's uh that's, that's enough for this for this week to get all into right it. all right Drew? question five from Jen. Mm. Jen asks us, how much do you see the pandemic changing the fountain pen landscape over the last two years? Into the future? Is it a pandemic? Pandemic. Mm. That makes it sound like a, a love of pens is infecting everyone. Yeah. Which would well, be great. I, well, I, I guess mean, that, that, you know, there was a, a there yeah. was a spike yeah. when, when everybody was at home doing nothing. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's changed the pen industry as it's changed everything from a, across the world. Yes, like how everything. could you not say- Nothing is unchanged. How could you say that? Yeah, how could you say it hasn't been? Uh, honestly, it hasn't changed things as drastically as I thought that it might mm -hmm. in the beginning because- What did you think was gonna happen? I mean, geez, in the beginning, we didn't know what was going on. Right. I thought that we were gonna have another financial crisis, like the 2008, 2009, like that kind of stuff. Yeah, we kept I hearing some, that. I thought some pen companies might go under because that happened after the 2008 stuff. There were several pen companies that, you know, had debt and stuff and they ended up folding uh, major brands that have been around a long time. No major pen brand that I'm aware of has that happened to as a result of COVID stuff. Or any major retailer that I can think of. I think everybody kind of survived. Yeah, that, so that, I'm very glad for that, for everybody's Absolutely. sake. Um, so that actually kind of, su su I don't know. If you had told me at the beginning of that, that this thing is gonna go on for two plus years, I would have been like, there's no way that everybody's gonna survive that. But here we are, yeah. you know? So that's actually very, very positive silver lining to it all. Um, I think the impact of all this has been sort of like popcorn popping. Like various issues have just been like, boom, pop, do, bot, like kind of all over the place. Mm -hmm in random and sporadic ways. Uh, I think it has absolutely, you know, shown us in full, you know, color how global all of the things that we buy oh my gosh. are. Everything is intertwined. You have different things that are being, materials are sourced from one place, it then goes to another country, it then gets shipped over here and you get parts from there. And everything's in containers. Everything's stuck in containers in, in various places. Everything's stuck in containers. So the, the shipping stuff, supply chain issues, uh. price increases for various reasons, a lot of them tied to shipping, um, have affected certain products. So that has been the most universal thing I think we've seen have been, you know, higher cost, challenges with logistics and the timelines of availability, but it hasn't universally affected all brands or all things. I think we've seen certain, I mean, like, I remember there was like an issue with like palladium plating or something at Lamy. So certain pens that had palladium parts, they were having a hard time for several months getting that until that kind of worked out. You know, other ones like Galen Leather, they're in Turkey. Turkey had lockdowns at various points and they had trouble getting some other leather goods. You know, it was like, boom, like all this random stuff everywhere. We were talking with Conklin. They were like, we literally have all the pens sitting here, but the boxes are stuck in a boat offshore and sitting there but we can't get it for a month and a half. So we can't ship the pens because we, we don't have the boxes. Oh my God. You know, so you're sourcing all this stuff from all over the place. Sandwich bags. Yeah. Yeah, we've had issues internally here. We, our ink sample vials, we had issues with them. So we sourced out new ones. We custom designed one. Oh God, And yes. it got lost in transit. We're still trying to hunt it down, but we ordered and we, them. When he says it, he means 
The entire shipment. All of it. Yeah, the entire shipment. And I want to offer these things, but the entire shipment has been lost for about a year now. And we're trying to still track it down. We told y'all we would keep you updated because we've got we're, so, we're, yeah. we're hopeful we've got good news yeah, so no. it's just random stuff like that yeah you know? what, what about like the actual you know uh, community and industry do you feel like we're seeing mm. a surge or a hump and then we're going back down because i kind of feel like it's interesting just yeah. like any you yeah. know some of my other hobbies mm -hmm. you know some of my more collection based hobbies sure during lockdown everybody you know they all peaked and prices on ebay and stuff like skyrocketed and i felt yeah. like we, we kind of felt a surge too like right when yeah, you know, a bit of that. Things first started locking down, and now as people are able to travel and get back out into the world, things seem to be settling down a little bit. Yeah, I definitely think that like as everything was kind of shutting down, people weren't traveling, they weren't eating out at restaurants as much. You know, they weren't going on vacations, and they weren't getting together with their family. They were basically sitting at home, maybe, maybe working from home, looking at the same desk day after day after day after day. Same Goulet Pen's website. Yeah, they weren't commuting to work or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm speaking very generally here. Obviously not everybody's in this exact situation, but you know, for sure, the hobby interest kind of things that people can do around their house, you know, interests went up naturally because you just had more captive attention around that so things like pens a lot of hobby interests video games all this type of stuff people get nostalgic yeah i was know, talking to and so, trevor and micah Tre uh, Tre trevor collects vinyls and micah collects pokemon cards and i collect video games and we're all three complaining like i can't buy anything now yeah all the prices have everybody's crazy. into my thing now right like boo stop being into my thing that's, that's for my, me <laughs> that's my thing i was in, i was into it before anybody else before the pandemic hit now i can't yeah. buy anything or you know like home goods right or or, or home improvement projects, oh, cost yeah. of lumber. Oh all my God, things. lumber went crazy. Yeah, any construction is ridiculous because it's supply and demand. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of twofold. There's a lot, like when, you know, I don't think this has affected as much in the pen industry, but I know in a lot of other industries, obviously when, I think this is partly with cars, with, you know, uh, home centers and stuff like that, um, everybody thought we were going to be in a financial crisis. So when things first shut down, they stopped making stuff. They stopped ordering things. You know, lumber mills stopped processing wood. And they stopped cutting trees down because everybody was like shutting down. Yeah. They were bracing for impact. But then it went the opposite direction. Everybody was sitting at home. There were all the stimulus well with the government this thing. and stuff like that. And yeah, and then demand went crazy. So they not only had a demand spike, but they also had a supply, you know, dry up. Mm. So it's, it's, it's worse, worse, more affected in other industries. I don't think we saw quite as much of that in the fountain pen world, but I think we have seen it in certain pockets. Like I know, um, you know, really cost effective, really inexpensive pens. We just have not seen as many new ones coming out. Um, I think part of that is because it was really difficult, especially with, you know, as much disruption as there's been for manufacturers to say, oh yeah, we're gonna mass produce this really inexpensive pen because any inexpensive pen, you have to produce it in very large quantities to be able to make it cost effective. So for them to say, oh yeah, now's the time for us to invest in this brand new model that's really speculative and all that kind of stuff, it was very risky to do so. And, you know, a lot of them probably put that on hold. Um, but also I think because you had so many issues with shipping and logistics and all that, that when you have a really inexpensive product, you have less margin to kind of absorb that with. And so even pens that we've had that have been traditionally less expensive, they had to go up in price because they had to absorb. And I'm not talking small shipping cost increases. Like, you know, you, if you order a container load of goods, and I've talked to people not in the fountain pen industry, but other industries too, who import a lot of their own goods. Um, some people, they, was, they were paying maybe $2,000 for a container, you know, two years ago. And now the most I've heard somebody paid was $42,000 just to get that to container from overseas. So Because they can charge whatever they want. It's supply and demand. They're like, know? I have your stuff and I can, I'm can. i super in demand. So, hey, how about an extra 40 yeah. grand? There's only so many. You can't say no because your business only, depends on there's it. There's a shortage of ships. There's a shortage of containers. Oh, there's a man. shortage of truckers. So you have all these constraints. So what's going to happen? Prices are going to have to go up. So that is affected the fountain pen industry because it's affected everything. That's why yeah. we're seeing some inflation start and to it's really doubtful take these things, these prices are gonna all of a sudden just go back down, right? Well, you can't just like build a new shipping port overnight. Yeah. You know, it's like you can only do but so much. So it's gonna take two Like to, the shipping companies, they're not incentivized to lower their prices once things kind of settle down, right? Not until demand curbs, yeah. right? Until they're kind of sitting around and they need yeah. to pay their bills, then they'll it'll come down accordingly, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's kind of crazy. So I mean I think I think fountain pens have been affected 
by that, just like everything else. But I mean, I think that's why we're not seeing as many like inexpensive new pens come out because <laughs> frankly, it's just hard to make anything inexpensive just with the way things are. Or companies are probably holding out being like, we're going to wait until prices come down and are more reasonable, you know, because it's not, you know, think about it. if you're a manufacturer, you might have to not only ship out the products, but you also have to import your materials possibly to make them, you know, from various places. So it's like, they're kind of getting it from uh, in and out. So it's, you know, it's complicated some things there, but I think, you know, talking less about like the manufacturing and like the industry side of it, I think for sure, like there has been more of an interest just in, in pens in general, just as people have maybe had a little more time on their hands, been looking for just a lot of things in life have been stressful. Fountain pens have always been just a wonderful reprieve from all the hard things of the world. And we've certainly have all had hard things in the world affecting us in different ways during this pandemic. So it's been a wonderful place to kind of just, you know, uh, escape from all of that. And fountain pens are a great way to do that. So in that respect, I heard so much from people about they're either getting into pens because they've been exploring, you know, new hobbies and interests and stuff, or they've been into fountain pens, but they've been using them so much more since they've been at home and maybe journaling and stuff like that, that they've kind of had a newfound passion and interest in them just because of the, you know, more captive attention that they've been giving their pens. So there's been a lot of good stuff that's been coming with that. But I think, you know, that's in flux maybe right now. We've seen a little bit, a little bit cooling off here in 2022 as, you know, inflation has been taking hold and people have been traveling and open, opening some things up and just spent other things going on in the world. Um, so as for... <laughs> <laughs> to go back to the original question here, like into the future, I don't have a friggin' clue. I have no idea what the future holds because we couldn't have predicted what this last two years has been. No. Um, you know, I'm encouraged to see that a lot of manufacturers are still investing in developing new stuff. They still, you know, the enthusiasm the enthusiasm in the pen industry is definitely still there. So I'm not I'm not like pessimistic that there's gonna be major disruptions with what I can foresee right now. But I think there's a lot of things that are evolving. I think there's a lot of things that are just changing in the world. And, um, you know, I think the enthusiasm people have for pens has never been so, um, I don't know, fickle that it's going to, you know, get tugged and pulled too much with what goes on. Yeah. Like we've seen, I mean, fountain pens have been to a degree functionally obsolete since the ballpoint was invented in the 50s and 60s. So, think of how many wars and recessions and viruses and all kinds of other things that have happened since then. I have a lot of confidence that the industry is going to continue to just, you know, do its thing, uh, as we navigate through all this too, but exactly what that's going to look like. Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> I feel like, you know, toothbrushes will probably make a resurgence in the fountain pen industry. Just, oh, you think so? Huh? I think so. I think that's the next big thing. Is that right? Bead toothbrushes. Brown spe ones? Specifically. Brown toothbrushes? Well, I mean, if it's your suggestion, <laughs> who am I to argue with Brian Goulet? Mm. i tell you, you've taken us this far, buddy. What do you mean, who are you to argue? You argue with me all the time. I think it's a great idea. Great idea. You argue with me all the time. You heard it here first, folks. Brian is the best idea yet. <laughs> there you go. All right. That's what we got for Q&A this week. Uh, now we're going to move on to our tip of the week, and Drew's going to take it away today. Okay, uh, some of you might know about this tip because it's been around for quite a while, making its way across the pen world. A lot of folks choose to use this method to organize their ink samples at a glance. Mm -hmm. So you've got your ink sample, it's got a white cap on that vial. You can take a page hole protector, you know, one of those reinforcement stickers yeah. made by Avery or one of those companies that make mm -hmm. office supplies. No affiliation. No affiliation. Uh, and you stick it on the three hole punched version of your paper to protect it from your three ring binder. But mm -hmm. you can also take that same sticker, put it on the top of your ink sample vial, and then using a cotton swab or some other t sort of swabby device, color that Sticker, yeah, because they're paper, right? As long as it, well, they make they got to be the paper ones. They make plastic ones. Yes, don't buy the plastic ones. <laughs> you will have not much success. They make they, the they make white ones. plastic ones, and they also make clear plastic ones. So yeah, buy the old school okay. white paper ones, yeah. which are going to be the more affordable ones they're anyway. Cheap, yeah, um, and you stick those on the top, color them the same color as what's in the vial itself, and then at a glance, whether or not you do still have one of our, our old vial holders, or whether or not we ever get our new ones in, or if you just have them in a drawer and you want to just kind of glance at the top of them. You know, you can't look at every single label at a glance to just see where your reds, blues, greens, and yellows are. Mm -hmm. But if you label all of them on the top, you can just glance and know exactly at least 
where you should be aiming your hand so that you don't have to waste time looking through all those, you know, little tiny letters. So I think that's a super fun tip. A lot of folks are already doing it. It looks kind of cute too. So that's an added bonus. It does look pretty cool. Um, but it does help organize things. So if you just need to reach for a black and then you want to make a decision after you get to that color yeah. zone. Yeah, then you can like group them together. Yeah, you know, and yeah I like that. absolutely. I like that a lot. So cool. um, you can get those labels at any office store or you know any sort of website that sells office supplies. So go forth. You might even already have some at the home. So you might go take some from your kid because <laughs> you know they don't use paper anymore either anyway. So I know I was gonna say like it's my fine. kids don't even know what these things are. No. I don't know if they've ever even seen them. My son doesn't. You know yeah. he's learning cursive though. They started that. Oh yeah. Yeah, I was super excited about that. See Joseph didn't because well okay so he was in what grade was he in when the pandemic started? He was in fourth grade. So he kind of missed the cursive thing. His teacher didn't really do it. It was like something at the very tail end they did Archer's for like a week. Archer's in second. And they're starting in second grade. I mean, it depends what the teacher Isn't that does. Interesting. Second or third grade, yeah. It's yeah. The right time. I wasn't expecting it. See, so Ellie, I'm all excited now. Ellie's been learning some of it too, but not like full on part of the curriculum. It's like a little piece and she's done it for a little bit. So it's like, yeah. I don't know. Despite like, that, he still does not know about the page hole protectors. So there you go. Yeah, I can't take any from him, but maybe you can. Anyway, get your hands on some of those. Try them out. <laughs> They're super fun. And there's our tip of the week. Wham, bam. Thank you, sir. Enjoy. All right. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, we are going to spotlight the Lamy CP1, the pen that Drew and I both have different feelings about. So let's get into that. All right, here we go. So, Brian, tell us why this pen is one of Lamy's best kept secrets. Well, I will say this pen is fairly popular. So whatever any particular individual's feelings may be about this pen, I get the appeal, right? Like the, the numbers speak for themselves. People like this pen. It is pretty unique. And there are not a lot of fountain pens that are like really thin and kind of sleek mm -hmm. like this. Now, just because there are not a lot of pens like that doesn't mean necessarily they've figured something else that other companies have in it. Does it there, might, there doesn't need to be. Yeah. Sometimes we'll pick up a product and we're like, wow, this nobody's really ever done this before. And then we carry it and we're like, oh, nobody wants this. There's that's a reason why for that. Yeah. It doesn't exist. But that's not the case with the CP1. Like we've been carrying this pen for almost a decade now. And, you know, it's never come up in conversation of like, should we still carry this thing? It's been a staple pen. Uh, other pens that we've carried from other brands that are, you know, thin pens like this have come and gone, but the CP1 stands firmly on its own two feet. Drew, That's right. Drew's a fan of this one. I am. Drew's a fan early on. This was one, you got this pen pretty early on, right? Like, I got was, I got a CP1 before I got my 2000. Yeah, this is one of my first pens. It was like my first, yeah. like plus fifty dollar pen. Yeah. So this was like your first next level pen. Yeah, it was. Um. So Drew has has long been a fan of this pen. I've always been. I, I get it, but personally, it's just not the pen for me. Right, and I can it's understand too, that. It's too thin. Like I, I have large hands. The grip to me is a bit thin for my liking. Sorry, my hands are kind of gross too. I, was I will, I will working say, working in the yard a lot. The grip but, is my least favorite part about that pen. I don't like yeah. the fact that it's plasticky and bumpy. Yeah, which I, you know, look, they got to do what they got to do, right? Like it's an aluminum pen. So it's very light, but it's also very durable. Yeah, but the the grip I is think not, it's brass. The, the grip is not aluminum. Is it brass? Mm -hmm. No, you might be right. Yeah. Well, the threads are, look like brass. I was going to use my phone to try and look in there and see. I don't know. It's probably brass because you can see the threads are brass there. Yeah, maybe. I don't think they would put brass threads in an aluminum pen. I don't think they... Yeah, you might be right then. Okay, so maybe it's brass then, not aluminum. Well, there you go. It's very thin though. Yeah, it's got to be brass because I can see a little bit of kind of a gold tint inside the But yeah, cap. it is metal. It's not heavy. It's very but thin brass. Compared, compared to the grip section, it definitely does have some weight to it. Um, yeah. but yeah, it's super thin. Like when you put in the converter, like there's not a lot of room in there. That no. converter is almost to the walls. In of... fact, the, the only thing holding the converter on is the actual post yep. itself. Mm -hmm. Like you're not even getting all the way up to the step on the It's converter. not going inside of any shroud. But that doesn't matter because when, like when you assemble the pen, there's no room for it to move around. So it ain't going anywhere. Nope. Um, now how do you feel about this pen? posted drew normally i like posting pens i'm a poster this is really i do long, i though. do not like posting that pen. i feel like i'm gonna poke my eye out nope i don't like it thing. like that's it's not it doesn't throw the balance off too bad because it's such a light pen no but it just it looks i don't know what i don't like it it's weird you know it looks like one of those pens you have at the bank that they like have the chain attached to <laughs> i feel like there should be a chain attached to the back of this thing you know what i do really love about it though 
Let's talk about the clip. I it's got a solid clip. That's a really nice clip. It You're, is it is it is a nice looking that's a stainless stainless steel clip. Stainless steel, spring loaded. Yeah. It is quite reminiscent of the two thousand. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's definitely got that vibe, especially up here with the kind of squared off top mm -hmm. of the Lamy says logo Lamy on the side. It. Yeah. Yeah. How do you feel about the the front of the clip here? Like the little the roll whatever I, that's called. I like it. I've got no complaints about it. I yeah. think I think it's like, you know, very German. And I, and I appreciate that about it. Yeah, it's very yeah, Bauhaus style, that kind of form over function or function over form. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Yep. Um, yeah, I think that kind of I, I really love this pen. I think that it does. I know that you said that there's a reason we don't have a lot of pens like this, but I do think that in your average fountain pen user's collection, there exists a gap that is filled by this pen. This this sleek, sure. very executive looking. Um, I don't even. I won't even call it classic because the classic fountain pen, in my opinion, is kind of the more chunky cigar shaped fountain. Yeah, pen. I would this, consider this a cigar is, or like a flat top. Yeah, this know, is different. I think this fills a gap that only this CP1 can fill, and I'm yeah. I'm glad it exists. I don't think it's going to be for everybody, mm -hmm. but I really do see the appeal, and I'm glad that Lamy has put it out, and I'm also glad that it has uh, been a mainstay for so long. Mm -hmm. I'm sad though that there's not a brown version. I am sad that there's really no <laughs> other there, version. Why would there be a brown version of this? <laughs> Okay, hey, you eight twenty three man. That's all I got to say. <laughs> okay. All right, the so, one exception that proves the rule. Right? Hey, hey, <laughs> it's success. All right, but they haven't done any other colors. They had that super expensive yeah, palladium you know one that one time. That's true. That thing was like a thousand billion dollars. I don't know. Did they discontinue that, or do we just not have it anymore? I don't know, That's but it was question. too. It was too expensive. It was pretty expensive. It looked really cool though. It did, but it was a fingerprint magnet oh, and yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So this is great, but I do think that just with this kind of like, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Powder coated or some sort of whatever coating is put on the brass to make it look like that. It's basically yeah. whatever they do to the Metropolitan to give it that matte. Yeah, it's pretty durable. Right? Like, I haven't look. really heard of a lot of people having issues with it coming off or anything. I'm sure, no. you know, it's, it's, it's a coated metal. So I'm sure if you put it in your pocket with your keys, it's going to get scratched up. But eventually. they should be able to add some colors. Yeah. You know, some 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 darker colors like, you know, a navy or a brown. That would be or cool. A gray. You know, they, Lamy has certain pens like obviously Safari All Star Studio. They've done a lot of different colors. They do special editions and stuff. And then they have other models like this: the the CP1, the Logo, the Pure, even to a degree the Lamy 2000, where they just really just kind of is there and it is what it is. And it's a big deal to come up with like anything different or any variation of gray or black. I really think they could open it up a little bit more, but I, w I wonder if it's a capacity issue or just maybe there's not enough demand globally. I think, it, I think it's demand. It has to be demand. I don't know. I mean, Cause we, we it's sell it, a decent amount of them. But I know, but, I, but, but, but never enough to really get anybody justify. talking about it. Like no one talks about it. It's just there. I'm sure the people who use yeah, it enjoy I guess, it. I guess. So I don't know. Let, let us know. Is the two, is, is the CP one your pen? Hmm. Like I would love to know more about this. And if you didn't even know about the CP one, please let us know that too, because I don't know if maybe it's just something that is not, as out there. I mean, we don't really promote it very often, like on not really. e emails kind of or always, social media. It's kind of always been there. Yeah. So I don't know. What is it? Does it deserve to be more popular? So, I mean, just- Is like, it underrated, Brian? Would you call this underrated? I know it's not your favorite, but do you think that this should be more popular than it is? I could I could make a justification for this being an underrated pen. I okay. think I think those that like this pen, it's appropriately rated. I don't think it's overhyped. I don't think it's, it's, it's more of an overlooked pen maybe than underrated i guess you could these are all kind yeah. of fall into the I same love this pen and i forget about it <laughs> well that's not so, great well here's the thing i had i gave mine away i i um really one of one of the uh, well because you know i did these office annual games at some sure, point sure. so these days i do like a scavenger hunt that i organized for the office but in the early days it was like contests and games yeah i i i put up my cp1 as like the the grand the grand prize and uh, crystal i think has it so so it sounds um, like i need to break out a can of brown spray paint and i need to give drew a brown cp1 what you, you know what, what you, you know what i will accept that because you're the you're like the one person i would trust in this office to actually seal it and to make like sure actually you, paint it to like prime well it. yeah you would do it <laughs> so you're the only person i would trust with that you know the only problem with that drew is the grip would still be Black that's fine. It's plastic. That's I, mean, I fine. guess I could try to paint it, but yeah, know, that'd be kind of fun. Yeah, that's just a second a grade of, idea. One of a kind. Second grade idea you've had today. Brown toothbrush, brown CP1. You were just on a roll. Was that, would you consider the brown toothbrush really my idea? Uh, more... they, 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 
<laughs> what are you gonna do proofs um, in the pudding anyway so it uses the same lamy nib the thing is cool so it's a 60 dollars on our site and it comes with the converter which is pretty cool wait this pen is only 60 bucks 60 bucks yeah Come on. so like that i that's where it's like a very solid next why haven't i rebought this thing i don't know drew dang it this is why we wanted to spotlight it because it was like we kind of forgot about it but it was like what about cp1 and it's like well people talk about it and they're like do they I don't know. Please let us know what you think about the CP1. If you want to know anything more about it, I don't even know if we've, have we ever done a video, like a review of this pen? I don't even know if we have. It's just kind of there. It's always around. So I don't know. Maybe we need to give more love, which we 60 are bucks. We're doing right now with a converter. It's decent. Same, I'm, a, same, I'm upset with myself. Same feed and, you know, steel Lamy nib that you get on other pens. Got black nib. It's cool. I, mean, it's I, have, cool. A, I, have, a, I have a gold Lamy nib, Brian, and it's on like an all-star. Yeah. <laughs> True. I know, I know. True. <laughs> I know. It should, I need to get a CP1 and put it on that. You need to paint a CP1 brown yes! and put a gold nib on it and have a one of a kind <gasps> gold nibbed brown CP1. Oh, this, this needs to happen. This has to happen. These are great ideas. All right. We're going to, yeah, and you know what? You can fill it with your yellow ink that you've yet to use too. I've been using spinning. my yellow inks, Brian. Oh, well, okay. We'll get to that in a second then. <laughs> I was trying to give you a dig, but uh, I wasn't expecting ah. to actually use it. All right. So that's the CP1. Please know, let us know what you think in the comments. And uh, we're going to move on to the what's happening segment. Um, so the Goulet Pen Company gave us all a half day off last week. Hey oh. Um, hopefully you and Rachel also took a half day off. Probably not. I think but... that's actually when I did this. Oh good. Oh day, good. Yeah. Um, so I went to Home Depot or Lowe's or anything. Got some mulch. Mm -hmm. Got some soil. Got some other random things I didn't want to yeah. pay for. End up spending like two hundred dollars on just stupid things that I didn't want to have to mm. spend. Um, yep. So I put down some mulch. I, uh, did my raised bed. So, um, Ooh, yeah, I, you were, you I were pulled up that. all of my winter cover crops. So okay. a bunch of wheat and stuff that were just there to keep the soil active. Okay. Pulled up all that obviously took some soil with it. Cause you know, you try to shake it and, uh, get as much off, but you yeah. know, you're just going to lose some. So I put a couple yeah. bags on top of that to kind of freshen okay. it up. Okay. But, um, yeah, it looks good. I got all of my, all the seeds that I started indoors you know transplanted them outdoors because it is the 20th as of right now and the 17th is the last frost date of zone seven which is where we're at so didn't i, it, I should didn't be safe. Get like bullet didn't we have frost this morning when we woke up it was i didn't get any frost close. The, the the um it was dangerously close it said 34 on my phone so it did get close but i saw uh, some frostiness uh, yeah. at, at my house well, but it wasn't pervasive so the, th the just... thing is like starting from seed is an extra challenge mm. but really i don't care if, if they die then i'll just go buy them yeah somewhere. you're not like, gonna like start it's fine yeah i mean like yeah. it's an extra bonus like i did that from a seed but i you know if it doesn't work it's fine i'm still gonna get tomatoes um so that was a really good relaxing time for me to just nice. kind of use that as a mental health day which is why it's there um That's what it's all about so i just went outside focused on that it it was really, really awesome. Very relaxing. Uh, the next day, I took my son and my wife went as well to the Sonic the Hedgehog 2 movie. Nice. So we saw that. Um, I'm not telling my kids that you saw that because they're going to be very jealous. <laughs> fair enough. Um, <laughs> but uh, we took Archer to the Cinebistro for the first time. So that's one of those eat-in movie theaters. And he was just like, he had no idea something like that. Oh, and like they're that. big, like, huge recliners and oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. It's like, that is, he, that's basically the only way I would want to see a movie Oh, he the loved anymore. it. He was like, this is like a palace. So it was God, really cool. not wrong. Yeah, it's it was legit. really cool. So that was fun. Um, and then that, that night, um, we had some friends over who also have a kid his age. So they played and went rambunctious and everything like that. Nice. Uh, that night, though, so Saturday night, it was exhausting. So Shannon went to bed early. I stayed up late because we got the puppy and I'm trying to like stay up as late as possible so I can let him out so he doesn't pee in the crate overnight. Mm. So I'm finally going up and I'm looking at my phone and it said something about Easter. And I was like, oh God, we did not do anything for his Easter basket. Oh gosh. Like just like completely. I mean, totally, I mean snuck we, up on we you. all had it. We had everything, oh, but okay. we didn't prep it. We didn't talk about who was going to do it or oh, anything. Okay. So as I'm like mentally ready to go to bed, I had to scramble like, okay, where's all the crap I need to put in that <laughs> basket? So I did all that and I get in bed. I'm like, hey, Shannon, I did the Easter stuff. She's like, huh? Oh no. Okay. I'm like, no, no, no. I, I did it. I oh, did it. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so she was like, That's awesome. I shouldn't have even bothered, but I didn't want her waking up and be like, oh my God, we didn't do it. Right. You right. know, so I'm wow. like, I should tell her, right? Yeah. I don't know. Come that next morning, she's like, Oh yeah, no, I didn't hear you say that. Like I had no idea. So. Oh nice. <laughs> um, so almost forgot his Easter basket, but that that went wow. okay. All right. Uh, Easter, we went over to my grandmother's house. Um, mm -hmm. saw everybody there. They insisted we bring the puppy who 
peed on everything. Yep. Um, but they, they asked for it, um, so that's fine. They don't make like puppy diapers or anything that you can. Do, oh, they do, is, but that's no, we're not. Is doing that inhumane that. or no, they just not effective? I don't know. It's that's not how you train it to go outside for sure. Yeah, um, and true. we don't use the puppy pads either because I'm just like that. We don't want them to pee inside at all. Yeah, like, you don't want to. Tr- yeah. So that's not what we do. It works for some people, not me. But come to find out that um, the reason he was peeing everywhere was because we took him to the vet. Well, not because we took him to the vet. We found out at the vet, which we took him to a couple mm. days later, that he has a UTI. Oh. So that's why. Because, you know, Poor your guy. urinary tract infection is apparently pretty common in puppies. But so he just always feels like he needs to pee. Wow. So he's always peeing, even though he doesn't really have to. So it's so, like a little bit of pee, like yes. all the time. Yes. Is that why he's whining so much, too? Yes. Well, because at know. night, he's feeling like he has to pee real bad. And he's trying not to pee in his crepe. But yes. He doesn't have a choice. Yes. But, and I was just like, I'm telling Shannon, like, Aww. no, we can't let him out. We can't give in. because oh, that this sucks. Because I thought it was a behavior thing. <laughs> How do you know? I, mean, I you don't didn't know. know. I know. Ugh. I feel so bad now. So. It's like parenting all over again. Oh, You're just my like, God. You don't know what's going on. No. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I felt God. so bad. So this morning, he starts whining at 5 a.m. I'm like, okay, I'm coming. I'm coming. Because now that mm. I know it's not him just being a whiny puppy, he's actually got something wrong with him mm. um so i gotta let him out put him back in the crate is there like when, medicine when, for that yeah for he's dogs? on antibiotics okay. now so it'll like go get better a couple eventually. days yeah yep. well that's good so yeah but uh wow new information there so there was that um we uh got to go out um meet some friends at their house for um uh dinner sunday night as well and um I, we, a friend of a friend always has this like he has a professional chef friend who like that's the kind of friend you want oh my gosh like <laughs> they, both of them it's a couple and the uh the husband is a professional chef and the wife is a professional uh baker dessert person oh. like they're like the most delicious be, power couple can they be my friends too i'm telling you like <laughs> they always bring stuff and you, when you hear they're coming they're like oh boy oh boy my uh, the, the the friends who, who we know them th- through told me on sunday that they have been invited to dinner at their house before while they had just finished their own dinner and have thrown their dinner away just so they could go visit them at their <laughs> and I laughed my head off because that's really funny. It's it's worth it. They they'd call me like, hey, do you want to have dinner? And they're like, Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know? I mean, I would like put it in the fridge or something, you know, have it later. Yeah, I mean they, they they were probably exaggerating, but yeah. Perhaps. That's really um, funny. So yeah, that, that 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 was always that's always nice. Nice. Um and Archer got to hide Easter eggs there as well. So we did mm. Easter eggs there at our friend's house. Yeah. And at my grandmother's house. So he did, he had a good time. And uh mm. yeah, it was a good weekend. It was it was busy. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm having to kind of fool myself into staying up later for the puppy. Okay. Normally I don't have, I have a problem with it. You know, I'll stay up to like say, twelve you, thirty. Yeah. But because I know I, I have to, it's different. It makes me more sleepy. Interesting. It's like, I'm, it's like, I don't know, it, it is different, but I'm trying to keep myself awake by not playing um, like sit down video games. I'm playing the mm. Oculus. So I'm like doing all the lightsaber games and stuff like that. Okay. But then that just makes me real make tired. more tired? Right? Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> like, you've, you've been on a good routine. You don't have to change it. Just, I know. Just do your normal but thing and when, you'll uh, still stay I, up. I get in my head. I'm like, because I keep looking at the time, like, can I go to bed? Can I go to mm. bed? I'm like, and I'm in my own head. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, that was my weekend. Wow, that's exciting. Yeah, it was. It was a. It was a lot. Yeah. I don't know how you feel, but like, as the we're in this weird pandemic place where it's like it's not really gone, but things are opening up and families like doing stuff and kids want to do activities, and it's just like we're we're having to have like daily conversations of like, ah, are we really ready to do this thing yet, or? gosh, things are really booking up now. Like, should we, are we going away this summer? Are we doing, you know, and it's like, we just don't really know yeah. what to do. We we <laughs> haven't, in, in so we haven't um, done, like, I, I definitely would not want to go to a concert right now. Mm. Um, the, uh, you know, outdoor events, I think I'm, I'm okay with. Yeah, I feel better about that. Like we've gone um, to like a theme park a couple of times. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, there's a crowd, but we're outside. I can, you And know, I will say well that the movie away. theater, there was like hardly anybody in there. Okay. Um, but, you know, so this was, you know, Saturday at like 11. So it was their first mm. show of the day. Okay. But it was us and like one other family. Yeah. And so those seats reasonable. are, those seats are pretty spread They're out pretty too. Spread, yeah. So that, that wasn't, that wasn't freaky at all. Yeah. But I will but say the, that the Comic-Con we went to, that was uncomfortable. That was a bit much. That was a bit yeah. much. Everybody was wearing their mask. Yeah. But it, it was still, that was like one of the times I felt like, should I be here? Right. Is this okay? Right. You know? 
Yeah, and that's and so that's gonna be different for everybody too. Yeah. You know, so it's like we're still in just kind of this weird place. And we're figuring that too, just at our office. Like, okay, we have people coming into the office a little bit more. We're not like mandating everybody come back in. I don't really feel comfortable doing that yet, but we're you know, so it's like, but we have a nice office and we want people to be here and there's culture aspects to being here. So it's everything is in limbo right now. You know, just so we're we're still kind of figuring that out, just in personal lives and work stuff. I don't have a lot of company updates this week. There's that's kind of our company update is like, everything's weird. Um, so we're, we're still getting things done, but it is, it is kind of awkward. So yeah, I feel you on that. We're in the same place. I was going to transition to talking about myself, but I want to make sure you were done first. I'm done. Okay, good. I would love to hear good about segue. your mower maintenance. Yes. Isn't that exciting? So I'm not a big like maintenance guy. I love doing projects. I love destroying things and yeah. I love building things, but I don't get so excited about like can't wait to change my oil or sharpen my mower blades so that they are sharp like they used to be last year. I've thrown away a lawnmower before because I let it sit too long with fuel in it. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm done with that. This is disposable now. Yeah. Now, to be fair, I didn't replace it. Like I was moving and I cho I chose to not move with okay. it. That's a little different. It yeah. is a little different. But like different. if I had clean, I'm like, yeah, might as well keep it because yeah. it's perfectly good. But yeah. I'm like, no, this thing's <laughs> dead to me. <laughs> Fair enough. So I feel you. I, 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 yeah. I hate maintenance. Well, I bought, I, so I have a, I have a, I have a good size yard. I bought a, I have a zero turn mower that I bought last that year. One of the <laughs> yeah. Ah. Yeah. And it's kind of a beast. I had the previous one I had, I had for like 10 years. So that one got good life out of it. I ended up actually donating that one. Um, and that one, I just didn't really maintain it that well, if I got to be completely honest with you. So this one, you know, was more of an investment. I was like, okay, I really want to keep this one up well. But it was like great last year because I was like, it's brand new. It's awesome. You know, now it's been a year and it's like, okay. So I actually like, it's a nicer mower. I want to, I want to really keep it up nicely. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do the whole thing. And uh, I like removed the mower deck. It's got three blades underneath. Like it's a, it's a big mower. Oh my God. Because like time is valuable. I have so little time to do the things and my kids are getting older and all that. So I'm like, the more time I spend mowing my lawn, the less time I'm doing other things. That's so true. Like, I'm going to get a mower that helps me mow faster so that I can do other things with my life. Yeah, your time is money. Yeah. But, I mean, like any piece of equipment, you have to spend time to maintain the equipment if you want the equipment to keep working yeah. and doing the thing. So I'm, I don't know, I guess I'm getting a little older, a little more mature, and understanding that if you have things and you maintain them well, they will work better for longer. And uh, I didn't necessarily have the patience to do that maybe 10 years ago. And, you know, we were starting a business and I mean, things are still crazy for me now, but now it's like, okay, I will take the time on a Saturday and do this. You know, honestly, we were supposed to go out of town um, to visit Rachel's family this weekend. We had all these Easter plans, but there was illness in the family and we had to basically ditch all of that. So I had like earlier last week, I had like gone to the dump. I had mowed the lawn. I had done everything thinking I was going to be gone over the weekend. And then all the plans changed kind of at the last minute. And I was like, oh. I now have like a completely open weekend. So I ended up just kind of like doing this mower maintenance stuff. And I'm glad because it kind of took me longer than I thought. Like I had like the wet clumpy grass like under the mower deck and it like kind of dried under there because oh, yeah. it's a big heavy mower and it's hard to get under there. And, and it had like started to kind of like rust out the deck and this is a year old mower and oh. not, not like rusted out, but like I could tell that it was like clinging on and I was like, I don't want that. So I like scraped it off ground off the paint repainted it. like i really like did it because yeah because i'm like it's year one on this mower i don't want the neglect that i had at the end of the season last year to already start it off on a bad foot so wow. i actually like did all that and i was like all right i'm gonna do better you I'm used a grinder yeah i ground away wow. yeah. What, yeah what sort of paint do you use for the underside of a i use mower? like a, oh, i use like a spray like enamel oh, enamel, okay. enamel paint so dang is that gonna is it, I was like, is that going to be as good as a brand new mower? No, but it's going to be better than the clumpy grass nastiness that was under there. That's impressive. That That's so, a level of dedication right there. And I, if I hadn't had the plans change at the last minute, I probably wouldn't have had the time to do that. Right. And I would just would have been like, you know, sight unseen, whatever, it's fine. But I like took the blades off. I sharpened them. I did the whole thing. I changed the oil. I did all that stuff. I even put like the, this like run flat stuff this goop like in the tires so that if i run over anything i'm not gonna have a flat and get disrupted i like i really like wow maintained this thing wow that's next level yeah so i just you know normally it's not so exciting and then like i spent like all day saturday doing that and then i come in 
you know, and Rachel's like doing the stuff with the kids or whatever. And I come in, I'm like, well, the mower is sort of different, not that different than it was before. That's what I spent all day doing. And she's kind of like, okay. I'm super impressed, Brian. <laughs> like I, I, I've, I've changed mower blades. I've, yeah. you know, chunked off old grass chunks. Yeah. And that has been the extent of my capabilities sure so i totally am impressed by you going that much far that that is we'll see how much of a difference it actually still, no makes, no it's a, like that's not the point the point is you you went there and i that that, that yeah. is cool that is what super is, cool that's the thing i think also sharpening your blades like i probably would have just bought new ones i know they're like not cheap but see that's i've done that in the past but like there's three blades on this thing now yeah. and i'm like that's like kind of a lot to do you yeah. know so i was like let me try sharpen i had a small blade my mind i think was like you know you know 30 bucks or something yeah but that that was like 100 yeah exactly yeah you know so it's like well i'll try sharpening them yeah. you know but even that like took a little longer than i thought because you know it had some nicks in it because you know i run over rocks and all random junk like that because i mean i have a big yard it's it has what i call country grass which is basically if it's green and covers the dirt it gets the job done. That's grass. <laughs> yeah, that's grass to me. So there's all kinds of weird stuff in there. But anyway, so yeah, just trying to just focus on that kind of stuff. And that is one thing for me personally, going back a little bit to like, how has the pandemic affected us kind of thing? Like I've spent more time at home. So I'm just a little more invested in what our home looks like. Your wife's so hard to get home improvement materials. I'm definitely part of the problem. <laughs> yeah, I am. But still, even the mower that I bought costs $700 more. No, $800 more than it did last year. That's but, but, how much it went up in price. The okay, same but, but, mower. Oh, I bought it last year. At the cheaper price. At the cheaper price. Oh, wow. And now it's gone up. Maybe it was even more than that. It was either oh eight or $900 God. more. Jeez. Like significant amount more. So I was like, okay, I had kind of an instinct to get it last year while I was at home. And I had no idea that it was going to go up that much in price. Jeez. But actually last year was more of an issue. It was like, am I going to be able to get this thing at all? But now it's like, oh, you can still get things. They just cost like a whole lot more. And I was like, wow, okay. So like, I'm like, okay. So for me to replace it now would cost way more. So I'm like, okay, let me actually like invest and take care of these things. So mm. I'm spending more time like changing oil and doing all that maintenance stuff that I've never really wanted to do much in the past. But I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of a grown up. I should really like do a lot of stuff. That's why I don't own a power washer because I know I would never... See, I bought it. a power washer last year too. Let me see, I, I would, I, I know exactly. What, well, you have yeah. way more power wash. You have like professional power washing experience. Well, yeah, like now, I, that's true. I, I, I would not. I would not. I power wash houses with my dad before starting. Gulet yeah, pens. I would not drain it. I would not flush it. I would. You know, so that's true. Yeah. So that's the thing is like, I have a power washer, so now it's easier to wash everything. But now I have to like change the oil in the power washer. Nope. I'm dealing with spark plugs, and you know, I the number of like oil filters and all that kind of stuff that I have now is like. It's getting it's getting intense. But that's why you're a multi shed man. But I'm a no shed man. But I have an app. I do have a multi multi shed syndrome going on. <laughs> but uh, I have an app on my phone that I manage all the like small engine equipment on, and it has like all the spark plugs and oil changes and all that kind of stuff, and I can keep better track of it. And like I found that because I was like I have too many small engines in my life. I need to manage this better, and now I am. I remember. So. I think you. I think you might have uh, covered that on a pencast when you first discovered it. Probably. Yeah, I think Probably. I remember hearing about yeah, that. Yeah, it was around the time last year that I was like, I'm going to start doing things because I'm at home and I'm going crazy. So, Meanwhile, anyway. I was just buying new screens for my Game Boys. So There you go. Well, different types of too. useful. Yeah, there you go. Um, and then, you know, one other thing with my kid, I got to spend a good time with my kids too. I had my niece and nephew over and we did an Easter egg hunt and all that kind of stuff. Oh, nice. You still got some and family time. Fun. I did just with my side of the family and gotcha. not Rachel's. So um, we made the most of that. And so it was, it was all good there. Um, it was just a little more impromptu. Um, so yeah, that was pretty fun. And then uh, Rachel picked up a, uh, my, my kids love the game Uno, mm -hmm. you know, the card game. Of course. So there's a new, new version of Uno called All Wilds. So it's literally just all wild cards and it's all like skips and double skips and draw fours and all these things. So it's a little bit of madness. That sounds like chaos. This game. It's a little bit of chaos, but it's pretty, pretty fun and interesting. So you can just say your card is anything? Well, it's not really, a, it's not like regular Uno where you, like there are no numbers and the color, there is no color. It doesn't matter. You can play every single card because it's all wilds. Right. So it's more about like, 
who's getting down to Uno. And it's like, when you have a draw four or whatever, you have to draw, like whoever you played on, they have to draw four and they lose that turn. There's no so like the doubling victory, it up or anything that kind of So stuff. the game's victory is more determined on avoiding penalties than it is actually matching cards. Pretty much. Ah. Yeah, so you're like skipping and reversing and then strategically like everybody ends up with like draw twos, draw fours, all that kind of stuff. It's pretty much of like, when do you choose to play it to try to get the person that's oh near gosh. you from running out of cards. So it actually is kind of fun because it, it actually equalizes it a little bit, you know, because it's me and Rachel playing with our kids. Right. You know, so it's a little more, I don't know, a little more chance mm-hmm. sort of, because it kind of depends like when you get low on cards, do the people that are right next to you have the right thing to make you draw? That kind of thing. So I don't know. It's kind of fun. Rachel just picked that up and it was it was a, an interesting dynamic to it. The kids had a really good time uh, with that. So yeah, we've been playing that more. That's been a recent thing of this week. Um, and also like my kids, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how Archer is, but my kids can be sometimes picky with food. And oh, don't Rachel even I, get me started. Yeah. Uh, and Rachel and I, you know, we're busy. We run a business, all this kind of stuff. So pre-pandemic, it was like we ate at restaurants you know, more than probably most people because it was like, we work all day and I don't want to go home and cook for an hour. So we're going to pick up some food and we try to eat healthy and all that stuff with restaurants. That has not been as easy to do during pandemic life. So we, you know, cook a lot and we do meal kits and we're trying to do healthy, but God darn it, the healthier it is and all that, the more our kids are get picky about the various things that they make. So you end up making like extra stuff and all these other things. And it's just like, okay, this is a lot of work. So I was really tired. Uh, a couple days ago and I was just like fine spaghetti meatballs and like a veggie and Ellie has been really picky with meat but she likes meatballs and she likes hot dogs so I'm like that is exactly Archer really he does not eat any real (sighs) meat he eats garbage meat (sighs) and you want to be like no you child you will eat this healthier meat because it's good for you and all that but then you know it's contentious and that like ruins the whole evening and you're like, okay. I, I, I grilled you burgers. Like sneak it in there. Yeah, I <laughs> grilled burgers say. last night mm-hmm. and uh, burgers and dogs because um, it was left yeah. over from when we had our friends over for a cookout this weekend. So we did burgers and dogs again mm-hmm. last night and his burger was too thick because he, he can sometimes mm. eat real meat, but it's n- not a lot of it. He doesn't like yeah. meaty flavor and meaty texture. So yeah. I filleted his burger to yeah. make it thinner. Did it work? Did he like, was he, he all about it? No, he was full. He was full. So he didn't eat it. Whole burger. He ate his hot dog. He's like, mm, no. Because after whining about his burger, I was like, okay, how about I cut this thing in half lengthwise to make it thinner for you? He's like, okay. And he's like, I'm done. I'm like, Can't you wait. didn't touch the burger that I just filleted for you, bro. Wow. Because well, um, yeah. I know he, and then as soon as he, I'm sure as soon as he dumped that in the trash, he was going to be like, can I have a snack? So I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, I know you, yes. I know, I know you know that. I was going to, I told him, I was like, you ate your whole hot dog, which, okay, fine. It's, <laughs> it's a hot dog. It's not good, but. Yeah. I'm, you're not getting any snack. He's like, what if I eat one bite? And I was like, mm. Mm. if you eat one bite of my filleted burger, then fine. Like just, yes. but you're, 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 you're going to chomp in it. He's like, oh, this is really good. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's so oh fun. Oh my God. He's just, he's so, so picky. So, so my, picky. my glimmer of hope. So Ellie, Ellie's been pretty picky and you know, it's like, you want your, you want to raise your kids to be like conscientious adults. And like, you know, Ellie, especially she like goes to school and gets like, scholastic award and the teacher gets like the clean desk award and i'm looking i'm like there's 37 socks on the floor of this house <laughs> socks like and apple who is this child that's getting <laughs> you know and it's like obviously she's like going all in at school and then she just like lets it all hang yeah. out at home and it's like okay in its own way that just shows that she's comfortable like letting it all hang out and that yeah. kind of stuff but also you're like can you freaking pick up a sock every now and then you know <laughs> i joke but everybody loose socks around the house it's not just her not um, me i wear mine but forever yeah it's true yeah you don't like to have bare skin exposed if you don't have to um but the uh when i made the meatball thing after dinner ellie was like thank you daddy for cooking dinner and i was like what like you dream about your child is like spontaneously thanking you for doing just the simple everyday things and i was like you know i would cook like there's hope for you meals with all this like healthy stuff and get no fights about having to eat it but i cook a simple thing and she thanks me and i was like guess we're doing a lot more of this meal (laughs) yeah but along the burger thing so ellie does not like burgers either but i made really like tiny burgers like little slider type burgers we didn't even have buns like i don't know we we can't make burgers reliably enough to like keep buns stored so i was like whatever bread whatever i don't care just eat it i'm just making burgers and hot dogs so i made like really small like slider type burgers she ate them They were like almost meatball size, like ridiculously small. And she ate it. And I was like, okay, 
guess I'll make those from now on. It's yeah. just like Arch will eat veggie burgers. He'll eat the Morning Star veggie yeah? burgers. Yeah, those are pretty thin though, right? They are, and they see that, there's not meat. That's the thing. Oh, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Yeah. But it's uh, interesting. It is interesting. You just gotta keep trying stuff with the, kids. The more the more garbagey processed the meat is, the <sighs> more likely he is to eat it. I know. That's why Americans eat so much of that stuff, is because like I don't know. He has an aversion to the uh texture of meat. Really? Yeah. When chicken kind of uh uh you know how chicken the texture of chicken kind of um the peels is the wrong word, but yeah, it's that, yeah, that, it's that like kind, kind of, of string cheesy yeah, kind yeah. of a thing. Yeah, he that doesn't... freaks him out. Really? When meat does that, because steak does it too to an extent. Yeah, sure. That he cannot handle. So Interesting. The more real it is, the more like fresh it is. But if it's all know. like ground up and all that, then yeah, it doesn't like really ground up. Like tacos are fine for him. Okay. But if it's- My kids like tacos too. But if you make meatballs homemade, can't do those. Tastes too, be too beefy for him. Too beefy. Like crappy Salisbury steak he's fine with, meatloaf he's not fine with. Oh, because so Salisbury steak, let's be honest, that's like, you know, the jankety like version. Meatloaf. That, it's like the jankety cheap version of meatloaf. It's like, like meatloaf fillets. Yeah, basically. <laughs> anyway. That's so funny. Oh, what are you going to do? We're going to keep trying. But there you go. That's they're what we they're got. still, they're, they're living. They're alive. They're that's surviving. Right. That's what we're doing. All right. That's all we got for you this week. Uh, I want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback about how we're doing. We asked you a bunch of different questions. So please leave us comments. Take now the chance to do that um, and ask us future questions for the show, especially give us ideas for a pen spotlight because um, we're you know looking for some more of those. We've gotten some good ones in the past and uh, we'd like some more. Definitely check out googlypens.com for all of your fountain pen ink and paper needs. Uh, subscribe to YouTube, Instagram, all that fun stuff. And you can email us at pencast at googlypens.com if you're listening to the audio version of this. And my fun random fact for you all today is that dreamt is the only English word that ends in the letters M-T. Dreamt. Like I dreamt of my child complimenting my cooking for dinner. Oh, you're right. I have the first thought about unkempt, but that's put. Yeah. Not umpt. Dreamt. Um, How about that? There you go. Dreamt. It's a really weird word when you actually just like look at it and think about it. It is. I don't know. That's a funky one. Fun fact for you all today. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and right on.